All right. Okay, so this is a debate between Kelsey Moser and Weldon Green, and this is actually going to be on something that I haven't uh, actually looked into in the sense that I'm unbiased on the matter. Um, I know that both of the threads got front page Reddit, there was a lot of uh, discussion on it, but I didn't actually take the time to look into either one. And so for that reason, I think it's going to be really interesting. Um, this is mostly about how Kelsey made an article referring to something that Weldon had stated uh, that mid and the late game were the most important parts and disagreeing with that because if you only had a 0 to 3k gold deficit, then the 20 to 40 is all that matters. Weldon on the flip side thinks that training is a zero-sum game and if you train the mid game first, then it's going to be the most beneficial because if you train early game and get to mid game, it doesn't matter because you don't know how to win. Uh, whereas I guess you're not really going to lose games because of some early game loss. You're more so going to lose in the mid and late game, I think is his point of view. Uh, so let's jump right into it, I guess. Uh, so Kelsey, I guess you can start because you made the initial accusation. I guess you can start because well, I made yeah, the initial sure. video. Yeah. I mean, if, if you want to start, well, then it doesn't matter to me. Go ahead. What is easier for the for the what is easier uh, sequencing of the argument so that the uh, viewers can catch up? Maybe if I just go first and I can do the premise, and then you can talk about where the holes are in it and sure. your point of view about that. Okay, so I made a video. Some of you have probably seen it. Some of you have not, saying that basically um, that I think that it's really important for teams to train twenty to forty minutes because training is a zero-sum game, and it, you win and lose the game in, in the 20 to 40 minute span. I think that after 40 minutes, uh, it just means you're not good enough to actually end the game by then. So this is all about average game time. I said casters shouldn't essentially gauge uh, team's skill by average game time, because it's not a predictor of team skill. I think that average game time in your loss is a predictor of how bad you are. So like worse teams lose faster when they lose, but I think teams that win, win at the appropriate time for the composition, which can't be seen in terms of average game time. Because let's say that, you know, you, for example, uh, miss a Baron take opportunity or get stolen, then a good team will take a low risk play where they'll wait uh, till the next, they'll keep up pressure, but they'll wait till the next Baron to see if that, that's what their comp does until they actually go for the victory. They won't take a high risk play like a team fight or something like that. Um, so going along with this, this average game time thing, I think the 20 to 40 minute span is an appropriate time for a team to look to end the game. And that's when they should be doing it. And uh, what I hear a lot is the narrative of like the kind of TSM of last year, which had a very high pressured early game. And that's because we trained for proactive playmaking. So the idea being that if you're ever not in a play at any point, you're doing it incorrectly. Uh, and I think that because training is a zero sum game, although you know, halfway to the split, we did transition into, you know, taking the same principles to the mid and late game. Uh, like the, the fact is that at Worlds and on the international level, everybody's really good at playing defense in the early game. And so you can at most against a good team get a 3K or, uh, you know, benefit or a 3K deficit. And so the training that you do there should be secondary to the training that you do afterwards, which is the 20 to 40 minute where you actually secure the win for the team because you trained, uh, because because teams can play defense. In the okay. Game. I want to, uh, I guess, ask you a question on that. So what happens in a scenario, right? Because there's multiple esports, but I, I could list a, a reference where you can intentionally try to stall the game out or do things that it's not going to win but it's it's going to delay the inevitable. Um, and what I mean by that is you can have two teams at the highest level making correct decisions, but then a mechanical fumble occurs and it leads to the game ending in 23, 24, 25 minutes, which is very early game timer. But then you can have teams like Genera Green Wings or other teams that are not as good and they have wave clear and there's other variables at hand that enable them to require the other team to have either Baron or Elder. And that's completely outside of the other team's control. And even if the other team is playing correctly, it still does not enable them to penetrate the base, barring some gigantic fumble. Um, but and when, this, when, this is why I think average yeah. game time for winning teams is such a bad metric, because mm -hmm. 
you could win the draft and the other team could lose the draft. And the way that they lose the draft is by drafting a turtle comp. And they're never going to win the game ever in a million years, but they are going to go to 60 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's like they lost, you know, in draft. And right. the game time doesn't show that the, that, the, that the opposing team, like the victorious team that won the draft, played the game correctly by waiting for, uh, you know, certain item spikes and for certain objectives until they could break the turtle in a low risk way. But it so. also doesn't like it also doesn't mean that teams that have longer average loss times are going to be better because those teams that just draft turtle comps and have long average loss times aren't necessarily playing correctly or playing well. But do you think that teams that draft turtle comps and then lose the game in 20 minutes are worse than teams that draft turtle comps and lose the game in 60 minutes? I mean, you're talking about average game time in general as looking at a metric without breaking it down at all. And I don't think average game time should be used as a metric of whether or not a team is good or bad, period. I don't think there's a correlation to, to teams necessarily being good if they have a shorter average game time. And I don't think there's a correlation to teams necessarily being good if they have a longer average loss time. I don't think it necessarily matters because how long your game is going to be matters a lot on your composition. And it also matters a lot on the enemy team's composition and how the two of them interact. So by making a, a broad statement about average game time is actually misleading and it should be the other way, I think that that, that also is just not correct like you can't use average game time to indicate a team's strength or weaknesses like you have teams that have really long average loss times like generic green wings that are just bad historically and you also have teams that have really long average loss times that are like kt arrows that were successful for a while but extremely inconsistent also so it's like depending on how you measure skill it it your average game time and average loss time aren't necessarily going to mean anything at all so are we talking past each other then? Because my video was about how you shouldn't use average game time I mean, to measure skill. your video is about average game time, how you shouldn't use average game time to measure skill, and I agreed with that concept. But the point that I disagreed happened later on in the video where you talked about the 20 to 40 minute mark in okay. instead of, like, that was the part that I fundamentally disagreed with. So now I think we switch and you present your kind of thesis on that? Sure. Is that okay, Nick? Yeah. No, I, <clears throat> I think that's good. Uh, I, I feel like this is the, the more interesting part of it, uh, the 20 to 40. Because I, I don't so, think that either of us would uh, disagree. I mean, if you do, then uh, tell me. But I don't think either of us disagree that there's too much context needed um, for the average game time. I, I agree that there should not be any usage of that to determine if a team is good or bad. Um, that, I mean, that's my that's my point of view on it because there, there's too much stuff that needs to be entertained when you, when you look at something like that. So my premise then is that you can't just look at twenty to forty minute decision making because how you play out zero to twenty is going to heavily dictate how you play out twenty to forty. And also, if you're looking at two teams and they play optimally, so if we're saying no mistakes are made then generally speaking, the team that with the early game oriented composition, if they're able to get a lead early, which naturally if you have certain champion interactions and you have like a better early game team composition, then you should be able to just like contest things that the enemy team can't return or contest due to the way that their composition is set up. So if both teams play those compositions perfectly, then the early game team should win because they also should be able to continue pressuring these advantages optimally and widening each of these advantage with like small micro plays and things like this as they continue to develop. So in an optimal sense, you really cannot discount early game. And then when you talk about add into the factor that teams will eventually make mistakes, Yes, you have situations where there will be comeback plays in 20 to 40, even if a team in 0 to 20 has a lead. But it's much, much more difficult for a team to lose after they've established this kind of lead. If we look at the recent KT versus SKT series, we had um, KT, I think, really heavily misplayed their composition early because they had an early game oriented composition, but they could only get leads off of like SKT's mistakes, which and they didn't pressure advantages and the towers were still up at 20 minutes. So I think that that is like an early game mistake. 
second game, you have KT playing much more optimally through their early game and snowballing these advantages to a win. And then in the third game, I feel like KT got like these re this really successful lead, but they just like heavily, they had to make, I think I went back and counted, they had to make 11 mistakes where they were overextending on a play before SKT could come back. They had to make 11 mistakes. So that's actually really insane. So if you play towards early game, you can still have a much huger advantage and you can still win the game off of early game just being by being oppressive and by being able to make more mistakes. I also think that in League of Legends, as you described, there is a zero-sum game in terms of training. I completely agree with that concept. And because of that, we look at where we have our competitive advantages, okay? So competitive advantages for South Korea, I think most people would say are culture, solo queue environment, the way that the infrastructure is set up. And those are things that we definitely need to look at and be able to compete with. But at the same time, I think that if we're not looking at competitive advantages that certain players and certain teams have within their region, for example, if you talk about the environment and the training within Europe, teams and players within Europe, teams are much more focused on whether or not they can win their lane matchups. They're much more focused on how they can create lane advantages than teams like SK Telecom. SK Telecom is not as focused or as convinced that this is like super important. So what ways can we leverage that advantage to create a competitive advantage that isn't necessarily something that uh, the best team that you're targeting is overlooked. Especially if we look historically, when SK Telecom have lost best of fives, they have lost to teams that have been very early game focused. So I don't think you can look at that and say that there is an optimal area of the game to focus. Instead, you look at that and you say, what is the optimal way to play the composition and which compositions do we want to focus on training? And how much time do we want to allocate to each types of compositions we're training? Well then. Um, okay, shit. So, yeah, that was a lot. Yeah, yeah, go. I was taking a lot of notes. Okay, so I guess we should just start by kind of um, talking about whether or not there is a like platonic ideal for League of Legends. So, I guess if we start at the end and work backwards, uh, so your concept of like looking for competitive advantage and saying like you cares about lane advantage and, and uh, top Korean teams don't, so therefore, we should I look didn't to say fresh. All top Korean teams. Just SKT was an example I threw out in particular. Okay. I think Samsung Galaxy is another good example. So I think that like lane advantages, in my opinion, are um, basically predecided by draft. I think that when you go into a draft, you have to determine which lanes you're going to take losses in and which lanes you're going to take wins in. And if, if you have two equally skilled people drafting against each other, uh, then you should end up with a with rather good parity between the compositions. And obviously if somebody sucks, then you end up with multiple winning lanes and somebody, you know, doesn't suck then they end up with multiple push lanes or they, or they sack lanes for comp. Uh, if, if they need, you know, a particular set of like spells or CC in a, in a particular position. Um, and so in, in my opinion, like the way that lanes play out should be predetermined by the, the draft and people knowing how to play the game. And I don't even think that we necessarily should have to train lanes in the, in the pro sphere. I believe that like that's the player's job. They're getting paid to learn how to maximize their lane and they can train that in solo queue and they can train that in one-on-ones and they can theory craft that and I don't really want to waste four other people's time you know focusing on training somebody's lane when they're you know kind of letting their letting their team down by not knowing how to lane it in the first place so like we draft we draft GP into Shen and you should be able to win that lane uh, in the correct way at the correct timers and you should be able to lose gracefully if they gank you three times and you should be able to you know appropriately use your ultimate uh, offensively on the boss side of the map or hold it to get tempo, you know, when they come top and clear the tower so that we can trade equally or whatever. But like, I'm not going to spend the team's training time on your bad GP mechanics if you can't play the lane properly. So, um, so looking at like things like laning advantage, then I think that, I think that there is a correct way to play the League of Legends. I think it's a platonic system. So I think that in some metas, there's a rock, paper, scissors system in League of Legends where there's like one composition that 
that actually could be drafted that counters another one. And it's kind of like a game of chicken in, in, uh, in the draft who is exposing their, their draft kind of first. Although I believe that I haven't seen that in a long way. So what I think that league is, is that there are these champions at the top and there's like a, a certain composition or, or style of compositions that is mostly defined by, at least as I've seen it in the last few months, by which junglers are OP because then that determines what your mid 2v2 and your top 2v2 look like a lot and how much CC those roles need to bring. Um, and then, of course, like the bot lane island where you're trying to determine what the support meta is. But I think essentially, like, there's a, there's a, if it's a platonic ideal, meaning that there is a perfect best comp in the, in the game where you have the five best champions in draft, then each team is going to split those down the middle if they're drafting well uh, and or, like, try to take counters uh, you know, to those at the appropriate times, depending on where you where you can get a last pick and hopefully what your players can do, although they should be able to do everything, so that's kind of a coaching failure if they can't. And, and then at that point, like, the game is being played... By, by the time it hits 20 minutes, we should already know what advantages and disadvantages should be garnered by each team based on playing well defensively or playing well offensively. So, so that's kind of my point of view towards the idea that we should more all in on our regional strengths. I think that that's dangerous because I believe that Korea is ahead because they actually trained it. I think that if you don't know how to play League of Legends, you should learn how to play League of Legends rather than trying to... Uh, so, so here's an analogy. I say that bad teams who are never going to win, like let's say the eighth place team plays the first place team in NA. I think they should draft like a really unbalanced comp and go all in on the early game you know, or something crazy or like, you know, draft just like an insane top side of the map or whatever and just try to win through cheese, essentially. And I think that what you're proposing is that we regionally try to win through cheese instead of learning how to play real League of Legends. And I disagree with that. So do you think that the only thing that happened that is involved in the early game is laning phase and laning and being able to play your lane matchups correctly? Do you think that that's the only aspect of early game that matters? I think that there's three lanes on the map, and then there's a five-man jungle. And a lot of people say jungle's a lane. I think it's a five-man unit, and I believe that there's a, a offensive and defensive seesaw that goes on across the map. And if you're playing very well defensively, when a team appropriates resources to make an offensive play and they have priority on the bot side of the map, then you can get equal pressure trade on the opposite side of the map if you anticipate it correctly through your vision and you know that you're playing defense and you're prepared for that play. And that is what the top teams consistently do, uh, do you when think we play that against them. Playing early game defense is not a part of training early game. No, I think that's definitely part of training early game. But I think that you learn the same exact skill set by training uh, comeback plays in the mid game. So, for example, in the mid game, if you're uh, if they're piling up bot and you want to make a tempo swap top not a tempo swap, if you want to make a, a resource swap top, then you apportion enough playmaking on the bot side to like slow them down while apportioning just enough on the top side to try to take equal resources. And if you're, if you're a team that's behind, so let's say you're like 2K behind and they're making an offensive play on your, on your bot tier two, and they get a turret and you get a turret in exchange on the top, they lose, right? Because they have a lead, so they should technically be able to take without giving. Uh, and what I see out of defensive, like strongly defensive teams like SKT is they're able to uh, just be fast enough in terms of reacting in the mid game that it doesn't seem to matter a lot of times how big a lead we have going into them because they just back off turret and just give turret chip damage. And then they wait for their jungler to join and then they defend the next wave and then they they sit back and they give the turret and then, they, and then Faker goes top side because our mid cleared mid and they have a ward over the over the edge of uh, line brush and they just see him going that way and they swap sides of the map like instantly and just equalize pressure in a defensive way. So I don't I don't see that it's even possible to get incredibly strong advantages out of early game against highly defensive teams. And so I think training the same principles of communication and movement in the mid game allow you to just extrapolate those to the early game later on when you start training the early game later in the split. But they do happen. Like really strong early leads happen. If you look at like yeah. against top teams, if you look at over time, like SKT very rarely are even <clears throat> in the top three internationally of uh, teams with 
leads. And there have been teams that have been able to consistently beat them by playing towards early game or drafting towards early game style of composition. Like, even if we talk about, like, part of the reason that is, is that Faker himself and the way he approaches the laning phase is actually, like, fairly aggressive. And he will go over because he, like, prioritizes having this type of mid-pressure. There was the exchange in the KT series, and part of the way that KT really misplayed their early game is that Pawn had Jace, but instead uh, Faker would clear the the wave and then he waited in the side brush for pawn to like kind of walk forward and clear out and then he immediately chunked pawn and so it was really hard for pawn to contest the wave after that so he's playing like the matchup that should have necessarily not necessarily been good for him which was like rise against the jace in a way that uh necessarily kind of shut down kt's early but this is like still i wouldn't necessarily characterize that as like super defensive play, I would just characterize it as playing or looking for leverage and openings in the early game, which I feel like teams are not necessarily, like, this is a skill that has to be played. And the fact that he's able to do that, like, that type of thing is an abusable aspect of the way that SKT like to play the game. Well, first, I, I think it's interesting that we only think of aggression as aggression. Sometimes you can use aggression as defense. Um, you, you can use it to That's mask exactly how we train. defensive properties. Yeah. Right. Um, and then on top of that, I mean, do seven will be a says sometimes. It doesn't mean that it's the optimal play. And when we're talking about pro gamers and careers and longevity, you would want to be on the side of a says. Um, poker professionals will think that a 60-40 is enormous. They're in love with it, right? A 60-40. But if you ask a regular league, uh, league of Legends person or uh, a better or an analyst if 60-40 is good, most of them will tell you no. And I think that that's very surprising because 60-40 is all that matters. Um, in the M, in the end, across a wide spectrum of games, and right. so to to say that yes, SK Telecom are losing sometimes. They're losing in the early games sometimes. Is like saying that do seven beats Ace Ace sometimes. But that's the way that they lose. That's the thing is is that like when they lose. Well, they I guess I guess maybe it's a like... different of of like passion because I personally want to. Like, maybe you just want to see you a can, team beat SKT, but I want to create a consistent performance that is the best yeah, in the world. Yeah, I think you can. By leveraging a competitive advantage, I think you can create, like, a separate thing that isn't necessarily because, like, there are teams that have done really well and been considered the best in the world that haven't necessarily copied this mid-like game decision-making. I watched a I video think, I think that was before where the... you... Yeah, go ahead. I watched Sorry. a video where you said that Samsung Galaxy White was probably the best team in the history of League of Legends. And they were definitely a team that all in on the early game decision making. And like they actually, when they lost their games and when they did poorly, it was when um, like they would lose their games rarely, but it would be definitely because of these late game decision making. So their late game decision making was not as strong as the early game decision making, but they were still a very oppressive and strong team in that sense. So I think that there are ways to create leverage from advantages in the early game that and then like when you talk about just like laning and the jungle this is like a really nebulous idea right so what what are we missing right in the early games of like <clears throat> european would, teams for example are we, we missing like are we missing just like tunneling in and saying that we can't get this advantage with our comp because i agree 60 40 is huge and if you have a composition that has a slight advantage in the early game and you're not pressuring it you're misplaying that composition no matter, no matter what, all stages of the game are going to be important if we're assuming a perfectly played game. Um, because if we're, if we're assuming perfect, uh, five perfect humans versus five perfect humans, then any micro advantage at any stage of the game is going to be important, but that doesn't have to necessarily do with the phases. One could agree, though, that, for example, in chess, a grandmaster could give a lower MMR or a lower ELO player a free piece. They could give them a bishop, or they could give them a knight, or they could give them even a queen. And the Grandmaster will still win the match because they understand more about the mid and the late game and the transition into that. There's, a, there's another saying that if you teach someone the end game of chess, you're teaching them chess. If you're teaching them openings, they're just teaching them openings. They don't actually understand chess and everything that goes into it. Um, and I think that actually ties into what Weldon's saying, where if you teach the mid to late game, you're teaching League of Legends at its core fundamental process, where if you're training the early game, you're not necessarily not teaching League of Legends, but you're teaching a much 
uh, a much more volatile point of the game because it's subject to change every two weeks to patches and things that are outside of professional players' control. And that's not to say that late game can't change, but it, it's much more constant, I think. So the principles of late game that I think can be easily changed and that Riot have even discussed changing are things like the importance of Baron, right? That's something that they could change at any time. People look at the way that lane swaps were changed, and yeah, that drastically changed the early game, but the principles of creating pressure through strong pushing lanes and using that to invade and control the jungle and control space from that have always existed. Principles of tempo have always existed. The yes. idea is that if you get an advantage in a lane, that's going to drastically change the way that you play mid late. In the second game or in the first game between flash Wolves and g2 you had a situation where g2 made the choice to play around the fact that they had the renekton whereas like flash wolves played around the fact that they had the leblanc and they controlled the leblanc and they kept the leblanc from get going off your renekton before like patch 7.4 when the black cleaver gets changed and you have like the extra health on it is going to not really necessarily do a whole lot for you. So that is misplaying your early game according to what your composition needs. And the fact that they so, G2 didn't really focus on the LeBlanc, I think was a big problem. And as soon as like Flash Wolf has had the opening and a tower fell topside, they were able to target and isolate the LeBlanc and keep the LeBlanc in a position where it couldn't necessarily burst down the enemy target. Whereas I think that that would have been really easy to play around because they had Elise and LeBlanc. And that's something that I think was a huge misplay, and Flash Wolves wouldn't necessarily be able to contest that. One one thing I really like that you said is the idea is that, like, well, you know, Riot can change the things that are important in the end of the game, but these principles of tempo and and pressure can be used throughout the game. And that's actually part of the exact reason that I think it's important to train these principles in the late game. Or in the sorry, not the late game. I don't really care about the late game. I only care about like 15 to 35 or 40. Um, which 20 to 40 is just like easier to round off. Um, but what I, I believe that tempo and pressure in the early game, so 0 to 15, are much more optimized. Meaning that like if you want to scrape out uh, gold lead by gold lead by gold lead, you need to apply the exact amount of pressure and the exact amount of tempo while simultaneously playing a seesaw on the other side of the map to prevent the offensive-defensive trades. And so you need to apportion, like, for example, the jungler sh or the, the top TPing bot and then instantly uh, recalling and going top in order to catch. Um, and things like this, where you're, you're kind of hedging your bets in terms of actually making the play. You're kind of, like, pressuring through existing and then, and then trying to optimize all lanes and all farm across the map and get maximum experience. Whereas in the, mid to, in the 20 to 40 minute place, the game simplifies drastically. There are so many different variables that that cease to matter. Like, for example, the the gambit I like to use is always face checking. Like, you could say like either there is an Elise in this bush, in which case I will, if I go in and I will die, or he's not in this bush, in which case he's in the wrong place on the map. So it doesn't matter if he's there or not. So you just assume he's in the bush because if he's in the bush, then you lose, and if he's not in the bush then it, it doesn't matter because he's screwing up, and so you automatically win. So you don't need to actually go and verify that he's not there before you take your victory, right? So, so I think that's true of the early game as well, that there is a correct right, place but for in the, the but in, in, in the early the game, opposition. you're not doing it correctly if you stick all four guys bot and then, like, clear the wave and then hit, everybody's hitting the turret and then you all back and recall. You need to be more uh, efficient and optimized with your like recall timings and your and your portion of resources in order to scrape advantages. Whereas in the late game, if you do that, or sorry, in the in the mid game, if you do that, you're it like gold doesn't matter as much anymore, and neither does experience gain. And what really matters is, are you sitting in base when your team is about to get engaged on, and are you pathing together, and how is your how is your mm. um your essentially like your shape when I, you're base checking and when you're catching, and I think that those things can be in incredibly punishing because all of a sudden you're in your respawn chamber and like the opposing team is taking an actual advantage is going to win the game off of your death. I feel like what um, Weldon is, is saying is he's not necessarily discrediting the importance of early game, um, but I, I, he is, again, he's I, saying it's less important. No, I, I'm he's saying, saying it's less definitively. Important. 
he he's saying it's it's less than I mean if you have to make it but he's, he's not discrediting that it has importance he's just saying it's less important which isn't necessarily the same thing I mean I don't think it's less important though so uh so the thing I think I think actually the Samsung white point uh is also really good and I want to touch on that because I think it might get to a crux that of like philosophy behind that statement that we could then debate and the idea is like I think Samsung white is the best team in the history of League of Legends Okay. Because of the differential they had between them and any opponent so, they had, let me let me. But ask I think a question. if they played, a, I think if they played a team nowadays, they would get stomped. They would get massacred. Yeah, but you also I said that their compositional. That. You said their compositional. The reason why you thought they were the best is because their compositional uh, understanding was superior. So that's me, why I used it as an example. So if in uh, Chelsea, do you play chess at all? Um, I haven't in a really long time, but I know okay. how the game works. But if if we taught you openings uh, mm -hmm. up to you know fifteen moves or something, right? Then yeah. you have a you have a good opening. You have an opening that uh, a grandmaster could use in a in an official match or something. It doesn't mean that you know how to play out the game from that point. I'm not arguing that early game is incredibly more important than mid or late game. I'm arguing that early game is as important. But how is it as important if, it, if it's much more simplistic? I don't think it's much more simplistic to play out the late game because like, you haven't really been able to answer the question, which is that why doesn't it matter like where the team is positioned on the map in the early game? I think that still really matters, especially if you're looking specifically at mid game. Like your death timers aren't going to be nearly as punishing like in mid game as they are like past 40 minutes. So if you're like looking at between 20 and 40 specifically, right? What you're having there is a situation where a team that has played mid -ga early game really really well. And okay, so we're saying that like everyone is choosing their own adventure, right? And everyone is choosing what to train. So you have a team that has trained early game really, really well. And you have a team that has trained mid game or late game really, really well. And so you're going to assume based on this information that the early game team is going to make a lot fewer mistakes early game than the mid to late game team. So in this situation, you have an early game team that's really good at identifying where the advantages are and pressuring them and using those advantage, not just in the lane or on the side of the map where the advantages are, but also being able to transfer them to the other lanes. So where you might nece not necessarily have the best push advantage or the best side advantage, and then just snowball the map really, really efficiently there. At that point, you have like, you're able to, you actually are theoretically able to acquire a gold lead in those situations. And then from there is when like, Okay, you have these mid-game situations, you lose a team fight because you misposition somewhere on mid-game, you come back and because you understand the principles that are good from early game are still effective in mid-game and these principles are keep lanes pushing. Okay, so you get a play that happens really well in the mid-game. What do you do? Do you instantly back? Do you take an objective or do you go to side lanes and you place, 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 ha, excuse me, place vision and push out the waves? If your answer is back, obviously you're not really doing anything with this advantage. You're just like picking up items, whatever. So that's like not going to be the best play. If you go an objective, then it's really easy for the enemy team, if they're still on the map, to reset the play from there, okay? So they're able to just reset the play from there, which presents prevents you from like you necessarily utilizing your tempo advantage so i think that this principle is like really huge because if you're making sure you're securing the map and the sidelines after a play right then you're able to return and continue pressuring these advantages really really well and this is something that you learn even in an early gameplay and like and effectively breaking down an early gameplay and then when you have a lane with an advantage or an area with advantage you know how to play with that advantage and where to move that advantage on the map and your decision making in the mid and late game actually becomes even easier because you know where your advantages are you have your advantages and you're able to like actually make it more difficult for them to make late game decisions they can no longer necessarily like contest the baron really really easily because they don't know if you're like slightly advantageous mid laner or something is there and can take advantage of them things like this like actually make it more difficult to make mid to late game decisions and so if your early game training can be differentiated and really focused and you are assuming that like not all teams are going to have the competitive advantage and you're really really like honing in on your competitive advantage of early game then i think then you can make early game matter a lot you can make early game really really decide whether or not you win or lose
I uh, so so I think that t- Jennifer March April May June May May twentieth like twenty sixteen if we'd had this discussion I think that uh, I would have agreed almost completely with the idea of using using training principles from the early game to cascade into like the same principles in a late game but all of my tests where I have uh, essentially done that and then seen the effect that it has on decision making at other points in the game have essentially like changed my mind and convinced me that it's actually better to train the the more important decisions uh, in the mid game so the 20 to 40 minute point uh, in situ so like actually in the environment that they're in as a way of translating those ideas back to the early game later. I think that I I would have agreed with this idea because um, because of this concept. So so let's back jump back to like March of May. Yeah, May May 20th, uh, 2016. So my philosophy toward League of Legends is that it's very similar to baseball and that it's a game of errors, right? So there are forced errors and unforced errors. And you will have unforced errors in a game. There are infinite amount of errors to make, and it is impossible to play League of Legends perfectly. Period. Uh, So there's unforced errors. Now, an unforced error is completely unpredictable, meaning that you can't necessarily take advantage of it. So let's say somebody buys two boots, and then they refund one. That's an unforced error. And you don't happen to be near the shop and able to like shoot a long-range skill shot to put them into combat and make it so they can't uh, refund their boots. You can't punish that error, right? So there are a lot of unforced errors in terms of pathing, in terms of like what you do, where where you don't ward, um, where people leave themselves exposed, um, where people like mess up their level ones that are just never punished because the teams don't know about them or aren't in a position to actually punish them because they just can't get there fast enough, even if they realize that this unforced error is going on. So I prefer to use forced errors, much like in tennis and baseball, where you win essentially by forcing errors. The way that you do that is proactive play. So you put you push your lines of pressure and playmaking up to the edge of where the opponent is existing in terms of their defensive structure, and you apply pressure at all points. And then when somebody makes an error, you are there to capitalize on it. And even better, when you make an error, because you have the pressure and the tempo you don't actually lose much for it other than these intangibles of pressure and tempo, which you can, if you structure it right in your patient, pretty much get back immediately if you're doing the, the early part correctly. And so what happens is the other team makes many more forced errors and you make Correct. many less forced and so errors and you make the maybe the same team. amount of unforced errors, let's say on both sides of the team, given that they're the same skill level. Uh, but you get to take advantages from yours and they don't get to take advantage from yours. So that is essentially like the mindset that I had towards how to structure um, like perfect League of Legends when when I went into it. But what I found out later uh, was essentially that um, it is, in my opinion, not possible to, against a team that is playing incredibly good defense, the defensive moves uh, uh, against like a full court press of, of pressure, the defensive moves against full court press um, are strong enough in, in how they save you from that pressure, that they can mitigate the lead that you would need to get to automatically win the game later. And then I saw that the refinement of these early game principles, actually, you learn exactly what you train and nothing more. So you learn what you learn and in the for a lot of people until you train something for like a decade, right? So. Uh, for for the people who are training these skills, like the transferable, like you still have to go and transfer that skill to the to the mid game. So you still have to go have that mid game scenario. Be like, aha, this is the same principle. You see, you should have gone here and done this, and like, ah, oh, connect the dots. So they learn it faster, but that doesn't matter because you're losing the game. And so I think that like I was convinced <clears> through <throat> my experiences, like in training <clears throat> after that, that I was that, like basically that it should be the other way around that you should train these principles in the mid game where the punishment is more severe and you're training the more important decisions that actually win and lose the game, which are like immediately clear and punishable. And then you can transfer those same exact principles to the early game, but you get a a feeling of patience around them because you have a way to effectively play against these, um, these heavyweights in the Mm -hmm. mid game. And so you're not as 
liable to take medium risk, medium reward plays, and you stick with the low risk, high reward plays that are, or low risk, medium reward plays that are necessary to kind of like catapult yourself forward. So first, what, what tests are you talking about that you did? Uh, I can't, <laughs> I can't really talk about that. Um, I mean, I guess that's I don't think in it. public because <clears throat> like, I don't think that I can violate NDAs of teams that the, the team that I was training with, but basically I just trained and and put a lot of so essentially when you pay attention to something else, you're not paying attention to the other thing, right? So training is a zero sum game. You have 20 minutes between each scrim to train principles. There are an infinite number of mistakes to train in a game, and so you choose the ones that fit the narrative of growth. That and you people pay attention to what is tracked, right? So we tracked variables that were in line with what we were training. And we presented those variables, you know, for each player in a, in a growth chart, and we discussed strategies in order to improve those variables. And so we trained those portions of the game intently and intensively. Uh, and the result was that the instincts of the mid-game plays were not as honed as people who trained uh, the mid-game. I just think it's faster. I think it's a faster way to get to the world stage. I think that like what you're saying makes sense if you want to spend two years or three years to catch up, but I want to spend like half a year or one year to catch up. And so I think that I need to take curve jumps in my training, which means I think that I need to train the most core fundamental principles of how to play perfect League of Legends. And I think those are found starting with the Nexus. The most important part of the game is when you kill the Nexus. The second most important part is when you crack the inhibitor. The third most important part is when you crack the base turret. So you work backwards from those structures and from those plays to the less important parts of the game, and you derive those principles and apply them there. The, because the, you need. To... Sorry. The, well, the 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 thing is, is that you're you're both sort of right. Weldon, you're correct um, that it I or I would uh, personally say that you're correct in the standpoint that. These are humans. If it was all supercomputers, then every stage would be equally as important. Because then any error would result in the end of the game. Almost. Or likely. It, in a it would predictable result. outcome based on the composition. Right. So perfectly predictable. Right. But I think, I think in a, a game of humans, um, I, I think that what you're saying makes sense. Because we're talking about humans. We're not talking about supercomputers. And we're talking about 10 by, by the same principle, okay, if mm -hmm. you're expecting hum we're playing with humans and not supercomputers, um, when you're talking about mid-game where mistakes are much more punishing, the way you make mistakes in mid-game less punishing is also by training early game. And when you're breaking down principles and stages, obviously it's a useful technique for training. I'm not debating that at all. Uh, what I think, though, is that if you're not able to convey that the things that you're learning in early game are also important in mid game, then that's like also an issue. Because I think that w one really weird problem that a lot of people have when they're training early game is to think of early game as like distinct lanes and whether or not they're winning. And I agree with the principle that like jungle is five man, but if you're already training and thinking about jungle as five man and thinking about the jungle's position on the map, then I don't understand why those principles like can't not then be transferred to mid game. And if you're training and you're building up your early game training really effectively and you're not like, okay, so I get the argument that you can't tell that maybe you aren't telling, can't tell that you're making early game mistakes when you're playing against weaker competition. But I don't understand how you can then tell how you're making mid game decisions when you're playing against weaker competition either. So, like, if you're saying that we can't transfer early game principles to mid game, then, like, why are you then saying we can transfer mid game principles to early game? Because I think that uh, if you just look at the idea of how league as a competitive sport is structured. We play domestically and then we go play internationally. And when you train intensely on the early game, you end up being really good at it, especially compared to domestic competition. And so in scrimmages and on stage, you get a disproportionate amount of volume of training of easy mid games where mistakes are not as punishing as they would be in an equal game. And therefore you get lazy. It's, it's impossible for the brain to not be lazy because that's how our brain is wired. Um, 
I think Daniel Kahneman put this best in Thinking Fast and Slow when he wrote when he like wrote this theory of of essentially you know th the two sides of the brain that you have this like hardworking one, this lazy one, and this lazy one is always looking for optimal systems of effort. That the less effort that you put in, the better. So so the fact is that like if you make a mistake and you're not punished for it, the least the path of least resistance is not to shadow box against SKT and be like, no, I definitely would have been punished there and beat yourself up and feel the pain to the same amount that would correct that error. So when you have error correction in the brain, there's this part of the brain called the anterior sigillante cortex, the ACC. And when, you, when you're like in the zone in training and you make an error, that part of the brain in terms of like the electricity there spikes up and then drops a little and then runs for about 12 seconds and then falls off. And during that phase, you're releasing a lot of neurotransmitters that are like going in and rewiring neurons. You don't build new neurons, but you rewire and take them over to learn new, new skills, essentially, or to add to your pattern recognition. So it's this recognition of errors in the moment at the exact time that they happen that leads to like uh, the kind of training that you have when you're doing muscle-based training, which is you see a pattern and you make a reaction and it's the wrong one and your brain starts to correct and refine your movement. This is the something like innate learning, implicit learning that like all pros must have to reach the top. So what happens is you get to the mid game so strongly so often that you are not punished by domestic teams enough for this implicit learning to constantly do it. So you have to upgrade the amount of VOD review and shadow boxing you do against teams that might be better. So you can try to anticipate the punishment that you would receive. So I think if you're thinking of optimal systems in terms of the competitive year, it makes more sense to train the mid game when you suck at early game. If you have, if you suck at both of them equally, you should train the mid game because you will end up in the mid game getting punished more often if you're, if you don't, spend a lot of time in your early game and you'll get that implicit learning in the most important place uh, where it's like really punishing to mess up because you make a mistake and then all of a sudden you make two tempo mistakes and the game is over which by the way is what happened with flash loops you know we had a cascading like 1.2k gold lead and then we, we made, made a two lot of tempo mistakes, mistakes in the early game before you even got to the te tempo mistakes sure yeah we could have made like well, like hundreds of better mistakes but the point is we got there with a the lead and it didn't matter because two tempo mistakes unraveled yeah but you didn't use your you didn't like transfer your lead to the side so you're saying we didn't do like lanes. i'm saying that you misplayed your early game against flash wolves in several instances and i'm saying we misplayed our mid game way worse because that's where we actually lost instead of gaining i mean advantage. i think that you lost your early game like pretty if, like if you're defining early game as 0 20 i think you lost pretty hard in the early game by coming out with a lead in, in any yeah because you didn't identify the lane that would transfer like in the first game you didn't identify the lane that would transfer well later on by building up your leblanc you instead built up the renekton you didn't transfer the lead that you had on your renekton if you have a renekton that's like ahead and you have an Elise, and you have a. I'm not. I'm not disagreeing with anything. Really, of that. not necessarily be anything. Okay, if you're obviously, not disagreeing. Obviously, with obviously, hold on, hold on, hold on. Obviously, ah, whoa, like, whoa, 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 The the argument starting to attack G2 rather than the principles, and I'm I don't think that's healthy. G2. I'm not attacking G2. I'm saying that G2 made early game mistakes, and if he's saying that early game training Hundreds. isn't important, and that he, I'm I'm disagreeing with where they lost the game. Well, okay. Let me let me ask a, a question. Would, would you, I'm not attacking you too. For, okay. When uh, would you agree that early game has less available options than mid or late? I think yes. That you no, 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 no. Wait. I think you have I way think, more options. I think the game super simplifies mid and late. Sorry. Well, in, in the sense that all the jungle camps spawn at a certain time. Champions have set, you know, items. They're confined to set set gold values. Certain amount of wards can be used, you know, etc. Much like a chessboard, all the pawns are on the second row. All the pieces are in their their opening stance. Yes, there's going to be invades and stuff, right? But for the most part, I feel like there's significantly less options available. Yep, I think that the early game is. Like, I think, actually, I think, basically, when I come down to it, I think that there is a correct play to be made at any given moment, effectively, in the game. And this includes early game, this includes mid game, and then this includes late game. So there is, like, I mean, there are a bunch of wrong options, theoretically. Like, you I could think path like an idiot, right? But there's, like, you could, there's also the optimal way to play, like, the early jungle start, and so there's that decision. In mid game, you have, okay, are we setting up, like, it, d it depends, like, are we going to play our composition correctly or not, is basically what it is. Like, that's, to me, I don't necessarily think that there are more or less, like, there aren't 
more correct options necessarily at any phase of the game. There's like pretty much the correct or the best play to be made. I, I there, think there's the, a more optimal play from an analytical standpoint, yes. Um, and you should play towards it. Correct. But I think what Weldon is trying to say is that the same principles that apply to coming to the decision to make those plays are not necessarily mm. taught just by the early game itself. It can be learned through the mid and late game. He actually has said that he thinks that the mid and late game is where the game simplifies. So I think he might disagree on that point. So yeah, I would I like him to explain. That. So I would like him to explain his perspective on that. Then. So uh, I'll give a I'll give an example of like an eighty carry catching farm mid, right? So here we're at 20, 25 minutes. And the 80 carry uh, on blue side is positioned near the line bush, and he's clearing the wave. And there are there are basically like three important factors here: like where is the opposing team's engage, where is your support and jungler, and like like you know why is your flash up? Essentially, like the the number of things that you have to consider are like: can I catch this and kill these six minions like safely without dying and losing the game right now? Um, and, and there are certain threats against that and they can come from certain positions. And if you have control over your side of the map, more or less on, uh, on the, you know, the side split by mid lane and you have somewhat control of your side of the map as split by the river, then you can pretty much guarantee safety. Whereas I think that in the early game, what you're forgetting to add in, in terms of complexity is, is the laning itself. So if we just take, for example, a uh, bot lane where you have, the position and the cooldowns of each of each person, as well as like the CS game and the trading game. And then you multiply that by the, uh, so like the jungler pretty much is known, you know, where they're going to start. But then after that, we have this like increasingly complex decision tree of like where it is that possible places that he could exist. Right. So it starts out like incredibly simple and then it massively, uh, and, and not only do the, all those places exist, like they, they exist in the mid game too, but none of them matter in the mid game. Like half of them matter, or like only one does. Is he in that bush? If yes, if no, fine, right? So whereas in the early game, like if he's actually top side, it really matters for bot side laning because you're going to trade completely differently, ward completely differently, position completely differently, mm -hmm. um, spend your mana differently. And I think even in the mid game, like depending on where your jungle, sorry, in the early game, depending on for mid lane where your jungler can actually be, like you might run out of mana for the push in a winning lane and then get pushed in and he might get a base on you because your jungler happened to be, you know, taking the wrong path at the wrong time after a gank and, and then all of a sudden he's not there to help you push out and your lane is, so I think the complexity of the early game dance is, is massive and there's so many things to take in consideration in terms of pathing, whereas in the mid game, it's almost simple enough that like analysts who are not professional players can really understand the correct movements to make. Um, whereas like in the early game, you must know professional level laning to even start to grasp uh, like how pressure is playing out, essentially. Why okay. is Ash bot? Why is Ash bot? That was the, what you opened with, right? You have mid to late game and you said like Ash can decide whether or not taking these minions is depending on like the jungle no, she's and that's mid. where okay she's so why mid. is ash mid because they're you you're retaining control of the barren area right now in hopes that they're going so you yeah I mean, we're sitting there right are now a lot of there are a lot more i'm just saying that there are a lot more variables that you explained in terms of this because it's like i think if, if ash shows up bot at 26 minutes the other team wins if, if Wait, it's what? a 5v5 in every okay. position. What's all the other context? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Is that Okay, so the context in my head. Context. Yeah, context in my head. You right, have two right, teams right. with equal gold with, who are team fighting compositions with engage AD carries who are who are positioned uh, around uh, Baron. Um, dr Dragon is down. Teleports are up. And your Ash shows up on bot lane farm. Then the opposing team should immediately engage onto the enemy. With but all of their there, five, I feel five like there's, there's more context that's needed than just that. You you can be even sure. in gold, and I I feel like that that yeah. That's but, a topic I, but I'm that just saying, like in the, in the default into. in the in the default 26 minute uh, position, 
if you're if you're a team that's in control of the game and and everything is like default settings then i think <laughs> it's pretty error ridden to send your ad carry to catch bot farm I mean, I don't know what you mean by default settings. I well, guess. if you if you have a if you if your ready carry is, I mean, it can be Ash, it can be Jin, it can be Boris, etc. But I you mean, have if, if doing if we're doing like temp if we're if we're resetting we're, we're, know, we're resetting, yeah we're, temp, I'm te okay. yeah I'm talking about like actually just laning, like pressuring the bot turret by themselves. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, W so, hold on. Would you would you agree that yes, early game, um, you can get wards in on certain camps, right? Yeah, I, right. I okay. really really encourage. So there's a set law inside of the game that camps will respawn at X time, and for the most part, we can determine how fast a even a supercomputer, like on Kha'Zix or on Elise or Graves, can c clear X camp. So if you see, uh, they start blue. Well, now we can deduce that he can only go one of X places, you know, one of a few different places. When he then shows up again, let's say that he has five CS. Well, the math would suggest that blue plus wolves plus red, because he has both buffs. That means that we know that a supercomputer graves cleared wolves at X time, or it can clear it. So we play to that because we're playing to the best possible scenario because we don't need to play to a worst possible scenario. So now he's confined by the fact that Golems, Wraiths, and Gromp still exist. He can't change that. He is now limited in nature. I, I think that like if you think of optimal positioning, it's really easy to predict that a team is going to take optimal paths. And the real danger comes in when do they, at what point can you predict a human to take a medium risk High, re high reward play where they like clear bot farm and then literally gank bot or were they to you know two camp and gank or right. these kinds of like variations so you have to cover these because it could lose you the game if they actually then make that gamble uh, and then snowball it correctly right and i think so, this falls in line with uh, in zero to 20 minutes sure yeah but this falls in line but with like the quote canceling that. that canceling that play out kelsey involves putting a ward at a specific spot at one mm -hmm. second of the game and then being done with it and you never are under that threat again so the defensive play is is zero risk it's like zero basically takes zero resources and zero time and you lose maybe one cs if that if you if you can't get the ward in place because you just play a little bit safer and you shouldn't have if you're afraid of a gank anyway you shouldn't be shoving it up the lane up anyway. i mean it, there are ways to play off of the fact that you're expecting a gank anyway i mean like even if you put the ward right. or not and if you're put, pushing out the lane and then the jungler comes then you can be prepared to make like a better play on the opposite side of the map as well so it's like not necessarily you're just wanting to avoid or not push out because you get a lot from pushing out and you get a lot from dragging the jungler so there are a so, lot of so like this is this is the thing that i learned that i had the equal pressure system like as kind of like a default uh, way of like uh, preventing the unpredictability of ganks. So if you say the system of ganking is like, okay, we can pretty much track where the jungler is. Like, I've been listening to a lot of pro junglers and they basically keep their team informed of exactly where the opposing jungler is like 99% of the time. Uh, the, the difference is when like there's variations, right? But the, the way to be completely impervious to a gank is to be prepared on both sides of the map to actually take advantage. And then as soon as the play is made on the other side of the map, you take a swap advantage and it, and it doesn't even matter that they got the successful proactive playoff. So that, that's one really good way to pressure it. The problem is that um, there's there's two pieces of that system. So it's automatically complex compared to a one-piece system. So there's one one extra failure point. And that involves like that person's back timers and that person's pressure timers. And then you have to coordinate between those in order to make sure that you can play bot threatening, like threaten yourself bot. And at the same time, you can threaten yourself top. Um, and But the, then I remember this one situation where I was... Um, it was we were, we were maintaining this. It was like seven minutes in, and and the person in the top lane recalled and just forgot to say, like for three seconds they recalled and then and then they like they were basically like oh wait I recalled and then the jungler game bot and the system broke and they took the advantage and we couldn't counteract on the top side. So you see how these systems are incredibly complex in, in terms of offensive play, but like the defensive system is one person one ward one time. And you just back off, and you give ground, and you wait until 
you can win the game in a single well-constructed play in the mid game instead of having a very complex system of pressure that applies over and over so, and over again for 20 minutes and one single error results in that breaking down. Let me interject which I think is right dangerous. Here, where so a lot a lot of the things that you're talking about about placing words at certain timings, recalling, conveying x amount of information and then keeping certain players on a leash uh, through information that's being conveyed to your teammates, etc. Those are all uh, principles of not just the early game, but also the mid and late game. And if you have those principles and you hone on them, it by nature will improve your early game to a point where defensive play will always enable you to be at an advantage. Why, why can't you then take like the principles from early game and hone on them and make like allow you to have an advantage in mid lane. Like I, I'm not convinced that if you just practice defensive play, you're always going to have an advantage mid lane. If like I think defensive play is a different way to practice the early game. And it's a different way to to use these early game factors. And also if you're able to get really, really good at making the system more complex in offense, then that's more stuff, more things that you can balance in the mid late game as well. So like a lot of people bring up the stupid like tank versus non-tank debate and people always say like you go to tank because it's it's simpler and all these other factors but there's like a lot more that you can get off of having pressure in multiple lanes at once and being able to like balance this one through one and if teams can pull it off i think that's like an extremely effective way to play the game um so and this also often involves getting like early lead advantages in multiple lanes uh things like this and i think it's like, and then if you play this out well, it's not so much that you scale improperly I mean, as long as you can balance the advantage across lanes. So I don't understand like why we're necessarily saying, okay, simplify the early game, practice like these things in mid game, and then that will help you improve your early game. Like why can't we just say, okay, we're practicing the early game and we're getting really good at defining and understanding these principles. And then when we set up and we think of a play, we think of like the setup, we think of the play, we think of the, the reset or how we're going to do it from there. And then we can transfer this concept, like maybe even in isolation to mid early. game to, to late game, et cetera. Okay, early game, there, there's a few things that early game does not have a part of it that mid and late game have. One would be uh, rubber banding, for instance, experience, right? Okay. A rubber banding mechanic. There's also Dragon and Baron. Those don't exist in early game, right? Rift Herald doesn't exist until Whoa. X point. I mean, if you're defining early game as 0 to 20, Dragon exists. So. Okay, dra well, I'm, I'm defining it as 0 to 15. Uh, I mean, dragon, dragon, dragon exists in that, but Baron does not, and for the most part, Harold doesn't either. I mean, it for can, the most part. yeah. It, it, I've like seen, I've seen more team. Control, I think Harold is a win more. Whether or not you, I mean, you right. swap, exactly. Okay, but for the most part, there there are still mechanics that they don't fully exist in the early game as much as they do in the later stages of the game. They're they're less, uh, they're they're less, almost not less important, but they're. They're, they don't come up as much, and the importance on... Well, actually, yes, the importance on them is less severe in the earlier stages of the game, because it's not as impactful as when Although the game... I think, it's, I think it's possible to train it, Nick. So one thing that we did was we just said, first of all, every single dragon is an infernal dragon, and you take infernal oh. dragon as you take baron. We, we didn't allow ourselves in training to do 50-50s. So on the stage, you can give you know, cloud dragon up or whatever. And you can also 50-50 dragon. It's like not that big a deal. Like who cares? Okay, we're in the play already. The jungler's here and he's alive, whatever. We'll 50-50 it. -50 -50. But, but like you'd never do that with Baron. So we just made a training rule. Like we're training for Baron takes, right? That's what we're training for. Only we're training for elder dragon tricks, actually. So every single dragon, we treat it the exact same. We treat it as an infernal and we, we don't 50-50 it. So and if we and, if, and so that means that if the if the enemy team's there, actually what we're practicing is to turn. Well, let me. Right? We want to turn. So because you can always choose to not turn in 50-50, that skill set is really easy. But the turn or the zoning that you need to do the choreography in order to make it a not 50-50 is like actually a really good choreography. So I think it is. I'm, I'm I guess I'm with Kelsey on this part. Like I think it is actually. Sorry, I didn't mean to reverse it. I think it is actually possible to train. Uh, if you really intend in, or are super intent on it, those things. But I've noticed that you have to keep up the pressure insanely and you have to like invent the mistakes that are being made because they aren't going to happen. You aren't going to see them. You aren't going to feel them. Whereas if you train it where it actually exists, you get it beat into your body by the mistake and you just 
immediately lose the mass of resource and you never forget it. It's burned in there. I don't know if either of you ever said a foreign language in a classroom where you make a mistake and like everybody laughs at you. You can probably remember that foreign language moment like for years because of the punishment that you receive essentially for the screw up. So that's really important, I think, in learning. So there was I a think comment in earlier. General... Well, I, I want to bring up Samsung Galaxy, right? Mm -hmm. They are, Samsung Galaxy they or were, Samsung la last year, last, Samsung oh, yeah, Galaxy, yeah, yeah. okay? Cheap. They were atrocious at early game. Their early game was absolutely abysmal. Their whole approach was getting to mid and late game, and they would beat teams by being better at mid and late game because they understood it a lot more. Um, now, it doesn't mean that, you know, good teams couldn't get advantages against them and win early on, but in the same sense, Rocks Tigers, SK Telecom, they could get advantages, KT, against them early on and still be unable to finish it out because there is a lot more variables uh, at stake, um, you know, relative to champions and color and objectives that are spawning through RNG, like dragons, for instance, etc., that can tie into this and Samsung would still win because they were more advanced at mid and late. Now, this doesn't detract from the they, original point. They were point. super great at just, like, sitting on... Right. It was just amazing how much patience they had to just like literally they, they would they would sack like they, they, they knew the appropriate point in the game between 20 and 40 to legit sack XP and optimized farm just straight up not catch in order to get pressure in, in one lane and segue that into just enough vision to sit on and then just sit on. Right. And so if we're and they knew that that one thing would just win them the game. Which I think is, is like is like a really important principle to have like ground in. Like, oh actually yeah. all these other things are cool, like pressure and tempo and all, but it it's just cascading uh, I, I I say like you, you know in warfare when you're advancing a front is if you played ever civilization, like ancient warfare, right? And there's a castle on a hill, right? And you have to conquer that castle before you can then go on and conquer like the next division. People put a lot of importance on the castle, but the legit, like, the castle can't walk around, you know what I mean? Like, they could, why don't they just ignore it and walk past it and and go and conquer the next thing? And I like to tie this into Eastern Western philosophy, because in the West, a lot of times you look at the wars and they were decided by the, 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 the lines of, of the castles, like, drawn in the sand and, like, whether or not you could take a keep. And then Sun Tzu comes along and he's like, I'm just going to ignore that castle and go around it and conquer the people. And everybody's like, no, you can't do it. Oh, wait, why? So there are these principles that we hold up as importance because in, or in the early game and in the mid game even, they are how you get advantage. They are how you win. They are super important to hold that ground and have the high ground and have the, the established like you know structure of castle and a hill or whatever. But then if you know the moment and you know the timing, you can straight up ignore these like invisible laws of the game and just do the thing that actually takes the advantage and wins if, you, if you're at the crisis point, right? So the ability to, to switch your brain on and off in that exact moment and know this is it and decide like I'm not going to apply pressure I'm not going to apply tempo I'm not going to clear this pink ward I'm just going to sit in this like all of these kinds of things that we train ourselves to do over and over again and you have the trigger to just go on the play that I think is what the brilliance that I saw in Samsung White um, and the, the, the beautiful beauty that I saw in Samsung Galaxy in their ability to kind of like do that of course I, I think that they they could only do it with certain champions, which I think maybe it was debatable whether or not they had the principles themselves or whether or not they just kind of knew what it felt like on that champ or in that comp. But anyway, right. that was a, sorry, that was a little bit of a segue. No, okay. So, Healthy. Yeah. So, I mean, the I, I get what you're saying with Samsung Galaxy, but the real the thing is, is that they would lose to teams that were better, had better early. Like, for example, I mean, Tigers were like are probably the biggest example of a team that I think was extremely early game oriented. And for a lot of last year, people would say that they were the best team in the world, right? For a lot of last year, even though they would lose to SKT. And um, so I think that that's like something they, they focused a lot on early gameplay and taking advantage of these types of situations and setting up peanut through, through topside and things like this, where like other teams would have openings or would have exploitable weaknesses in those areas. And then like, over time, they gradually trained mid game better and things like this. But I think that it's like really important to to isolate the fact that you have a variety of different types of styles like coming up and being successful. And I agree, Samsung Galaxy were really good at training like the mid and the late. 
Um, but then, like, he brings up Samsung White again, and they were, like, incredibly good at capitalizing on early. Like, they would be able to identify when they had a TP advantage and immediately go aggressive in the bot lane. And these types of situations where, like, like, these are all just, to me, these are the same, like, ideas of playing your composition optimally. Um, Can I, I explain think that, Samsung White now, after this? Uh, or Nick, do you want to go next? Really no, uh, I'm just looking up some stuff uh, about Samsung versus like Rocks, for instance. They they went one one in LCK uh, summer. They did lose to SK Telecom, and then they collided uh, at the World's Finals, and there were you know there was there was those games. Um, and I would argue like SKT's agency in that final like was very like mid game oriented, but like mm -hmm. in general like and Samsung they won, or SK which means like. It's better. Yes, that's absolutely how that works. No, that's the, that's a time. false pause. Yeah, that. Oh, yeah, exactly. Sorry, okay, yeah. Um, I just yeah, mean that right. like there it's are ways the to. I still think that like when you go back to the core principle, which is that if you're playing your composition optimally and you have an early game composition and you're just going to able to like be able to get these contests that people can't necessarily the other team can't necessarily respond to, like the early game strategy will win in an optimal situation where people aren't making mistakes. And so that's something that you ultimately do I, train. I, I, I just, I feel like uh, mid game has much more warding, right? Sure. Okay, and late game has much more warding. Late game has trinkets, sweepers. You have, yeah, you have trinkets. Right, you have, you have all of that. Um, minions now can actually begin to threaten turrets as the game draws on, you know, certain minion waves. Um, levels become important because it changes the impact of minions, whereas everyone at, you know, the early stages of the game, the, the minions don't matter because everyone's roughly the same level. Um, there's a confinement. Level one traits, they matter. Level one trait, yes. Level, le like, right, right. But I'm saying yeah, in, in yeah, a sense sorry, of taking yeah, objectives. Yeah, right. Yeah, so in that sense, the, the amount of stuff that can be trained in the early game specifically is still limited compared to mid or late game, because there's significantly more options at your disposal in mid and late game. There's the trinkets, there's multiple sight stones, or, or well, uh, the green smite, sight stone, etc. Sweeping lens, understanding how to move throughout your jungle, what is dangerous fog of war, what isn't dangerous fog of war. Um, these are all things that become way more important, and it is more difficult to understand those. I think, then the early game, especially so, because the early game gets switched up so often. Like, if you're building a strong foundation in the early game, I think, and mm -hmm. you're continuously thinking creatively about how to adjust your strong early game foundation because it's changing so much, I think then, like, if you're building those principles, then you have a foundation that you have, like, managed to train. And I do think, like, the main core early game principles, even if you talk about, like, matchups changing, even if you talk about uh, necessarily lane swaps disappearing, and if, if you're thinking about constantly, like, how to adapt to early game, like, you'll be less thrown off by lane swaps disappearing, I think, as well. Um, like, if you're able to build this kind of foundation, then, like, you're starting from, like, this core, and you're able to build up on that for mid and late game as well. Like, I just think that Make game, early game can be seen as like a strong cornerstone to training and as soon as you have like players buy in from a training perspective that this is how we're playing the early game and then like you can see like the way these simple concepts get played out and this is the optimal decision then you begin like building off of that because they also understand like how to identify at this point which of our lanes is the strong one and which one Whoa. we're playing off of and this continues into the mid game and the way you play your early game will always influence the way you play your mid game well, the, the mid game, has because it has more options available to it, let's say that you get a, a pretty big gold lead, right? You, you, um, th there were teams, uh, most notably even, uh, I mean, if we go back to Worlds or we go back to certain international competitions, I can go into StarCraft and talk about games where Western players would get advantages over Koreans, uh, not even just StarCraft 2, StarCraft 1. We can go into Warcraft 3 as well. Um, and the Koreans would understand how to stall the game out to a point where it becomes an insurance policy. Because the, the Western teams or the Western players were so hellbent on the early game and finding advantages, cheeses, ways to beat or get in a lead over the Koreans. And sometimes it would it would lead to the Western player winning. 
uh, over the Korean. One of the most notable um, in, in my mind is White Raw versus Slayer's Boxer. That's the name everyone here knows, probably. Um, White Raw, or no, not White Raw, uh, G5. I have to watch that series live. G, G5 versus Slayer's Boxer. He beat him with a three gateway bulldog on Destination. Um, and, you know, they get that advantage and it was enough. But had G5 not ended the game at that exact moment, Boxer would have been able to come back and recover and recuperate. Hydra versus Stork. Uh, Hydra had a monstrous gold lead and Terran versus Protoss. And it didn't matter because Stork pulled him around the map, kept using guerrilla warfare tactics, things that are only applicable to the mid and late game. And Hydra eventually collapsed on top of himself and Stork overthrew him, despite it should have been an unlosable uh, situation for Idra. Um, the, the thing about the early game is, yeah, you can get all of those, those leads and stuff, but there is simply things that do not exist there. All those warding things don't exist. The trinkets, the sweeping, it doesn't exist. Baron doesn't exist. You can't train it. It's not possible. So yes, if you, that would be relevant if I was saying don't train mid-game. I mean, I am saying train mid-game, but I right. think that you can focus on training early game and have like an extremely successful uh, and ex extremely I, strong but then team. you're escaping my argument because I said the same thing. I'm not saying don't train early game. I'm saying no, train you're, mid -game first. you're saying mid-game is more important, and I'm saying it's not. It is. But but it yeah, it that's is the argument. I feel I feel like it is more important simply because there's more options available. And if people are let, let's say that you have a team that's slightly weaker at laning, uh, okay. slightly I see, weaker. Yeah, I see the difference or the differentiation. Right. Let, let's say that there's a team that is slightly weaker at laning, slightly weaker at early game jungler rotation, slightly weaker at early dragons, but sure. they are so much stronger at vision control, warding, barren defense, stalling, etc. These are things right that become. So sorry. Yeah, these are things that become important. I don't, don't want to like key in this bottle on stream, so just yeah. give me a sec. Sure. At, these are at things that, that point... Sorry. Go ahead. Well, I'm, these are I'm things that a, exist as the game draws on. Mm -hmm. I'm so saying at that point, though, sure. the mid-game oriented team is relying on the early game oriented team to not know how to convert their leads. They're relying on the early game oriented team to make well, more mistakes. But why can't the mid-game oriented team be so much better at those things than the early game oriented team? I mean, they can, but you're still relying at that point on them to make mistakes and to, to leave the openings for the mid-game team to come back in because if you have an advan like a strong advantage on most of your lamps because you're like better at the early game then you're able to and you can they're then relying on this early game oriented team to not know how to be able to convert those into more successful leagues or bigger objectives as the game goes on and if they make more mistakes mid late right they have mm -hmm. to make more of those mistakes like much more mistakes for the mid game especially if we're talking about mid game as the most important part right if we're talking about mid game as the most important part like the death timers are not going to be as punishing as late game so you have to make so many more mistakes in the mid game for the other team to come back in sure it's easier to play with uh, a lead than it is to play without one. Yes. That's the assumption that you're making. Okay. Um, but I, I still... If, if you're saying that the team is practicing intentionally on early game, then, and then you have a team that's practicing intentionally on mid game, the mid game team should in the same right be able to mitigate some of the leads that the early game team secured. I mean, I think part, I think defensive play is an early game concept too, though. Like yes. if you're, so you have to train being like defensive play in the early game as well as in the mid game. So I think that that's like also a big principle because if you have, there will just be things that you can't contest if the early game team is more effective than you in terms by the time you get to mid game. But that, that's also assuming G2 perfect is play. headed to the LCS, and I'm freaking stuck in Finland. That's so sad. But we're, we're, assuming, that, uh, we're assuming perfect play, right? Is that what okay. we're... Okay. In that sense, so, I agree with you completely. That uh, early, mid, and late are all actually equally as important. But obviously, if a team gets an early advantage, then the, the recovery for a mid-game or a late-game team should not uh, be feasible, should not be able to occur. Um, but I think that when we're when we're talking about professional play, in the sense 
that we are right now, we're talking about LCS, LCK, LPL, etc. These are not uh, perfect machines that sure. can do everything. Um, but then, uh, but then, like again, you're saying that you're increasing the number of mistakes that the early game team has to make. Then, like, and then you're li minimizing the number of mistakes that the mid late game team can make. The mid late game team has to make much fewer mistakes to win at that point. The like the early game team can make like KT was still winning after they overextended eleven times into mm -hmm. Rumble and. Tom Kenchkop. So, like, they tried to force objectives 11 times and, and they how? were still winning the game because they were able to get pushing priority and they were able to take, like, inhibitors and things like this because so, their lead was so massive. So, SKT had to play it, like, just like that. Like, they had to play it extremely perfectly. So, if we're assuming people make these kinds of mistakes, right, then if you get a lead and you have an early game oriented composition, the burden is then on. Like the the burden is then on you to screw up the game, basically, but, and you have to make so many more mistakes to lose than the other team, who is m relying on you making mistakes at that point. So you're using a number eleven uh, to signify KT's uh, mistakes that they made against SK Telecom. I mean, obviously right? that's not right. like all of their mistakes, but I'm talking okay. about a specific type of mistake that they made over and over and over again. Okay, but then how many mistakes did SKT make to get to that point that they were in? I mean, I would have to go back and I would have to count those types of mistakes and break down and categorize those, which obviously is a problem. But I do think that SKT, like when you watch the way that they were playing, they were making much fewer mistakes. But again, that's something that they have, like they have to be that much better. Like if you want to contest SKT's mid game, you have to be that much better at SKT in mid game, for example. No, which I just want to be better than SKT in mid game. I don't want to like yes. find a way to. Let's like, say, well, the the other thing is that in mid game, so that I can actually mid game mid game mistakes are bigger than early game mistakes because of death timers. Yes, but they're still not so big as late game mistakes where you can. Well, like, well, well, LS, the, you still the mistake might so objectively be the same, it's and just then they have to. They, they, different. Sure. The mid game team right. then has so. to re react to your mistake also correctly to be able to make sure that you can't come back with a tempo advantage, right? Because if they don't react to your mistake correctly, like one thing that I noticed in one of the SKT KT games where KT actually like not a winning team fight, but SKT reacted it, reacted it really well. So you push out like they had bang push out mid and bot like match when death went back bot before he could back to make sure that they had like the vision control and KT couldn't pick up the tempo advantage when they respond. So like these, this is also an early game based principle that they have obviously trained things like this. So it's like, I mean, to me, these are, these are all things that you have to do basically perfectly, but the, the crux comes down to, you can make fewer mistakes if you are entering the mid game from a deficit. And if you're saying these mistakes are so much more punishing, that's, it's like, it's really good if but, you have a huge advantage and you can make more of them. It's like, actually, like, it helps you a lot. What, what is a, a, a bigger deficit? Um, being down, let's say, let's say hypothetically, Renekton has a Tiamat over someone, right? 1,200 gold. Um, and that's the, the advantage up in, in top lane. And let's say that it's 18 minutes into the game. Is that uh, a bigger deficit than being down a longsword at two minutes? I'm sorry, could you, you repeat? The team at okay, 18 so minutes? So basically, if it, why First Blood is uh, as important as it is because the, the oh, advantage... So like, how does, how does gold differential scale? So this so is something that I was actually this looking is something at statistically. A little bit, right. Because Oracle's Elixir is now tracking, thankfully, the percentage of the total gold that the gold lead represents. And so you can see that graph instead of the, the gold lead, which is basically like just kind of a pretty picture. You can see the percentage of what I'm saying is, is that gold that's, that's at 20 minutes. And I think, and I think minutes, that, that, uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead well, sorry. No, it's, it's a, um, so basically at, at 20 minutes, let's say 30 minutes, if a champion gets picked off, that is potentially minus 8,000 gold, right? While they're having their death timer. Theoretically. 
Okay. Wait, the champion when? gets picked, like, I don't know, 20, 20 minutes, 30 minutes or something, right? I mean, Not I, 8, assuming, you know, assuming that you can extrapolate. So you're talking about the reward of the punishment like, for making mistakes. Depending, so this is, depending this is on the mistake, the circumstances. Sure. Depending on the circumstances okay. of the mistake, it can be that big. Yes, depending okay. on the circumstances of the mistake. I think, I think, I think that I'm, uh, I want to, so, so like if we're talking about what Kelsey argued, which is that the idea that like you can train the same principles from mid late and, but we're getting deflected a little bit by the fact that the reward and, or the punishment. How, how can you trade the same principles, uh, from early and mid to late when mid and late has things that don't occur? I don't think you can. I think it's only mid game. Because I'm saying training. that. If you have a strong early game Tempo foundation, you can build off of that and start but training the team. The game. Okay, but the team but like, that has to build the, the early you, game. The way that you take vision, the mid game, build mid and late is like only trainable in the mid game. You can't actually train that in the early game. I think the way that you division, because like this is what I noticed about defensive they, plays in the early game. Like the bot lane can literally completely stymie a level six play by warding in certain positions of the river and over the wall with one ward because you can't clear it in the early game. It's like almost impossible to control that vision. So with a single ward at a single timing, you can take what it should be a choreographed oppressive play and you can find the proper line to back off of the turret. And then you deny the kills and you might lose six minions and some chip damage, but if the jungler then comes and you can actually pressure back onto the wave and your mid laner's in position to keep pushing and maybe goes top, then like, with one single vision play bottom, you can defensively nullify like a full choreographed, and you might even they might have even drafted for this. Who knows? Like they might have even drafted to get the level six play. If you draft Jin GP um, and like a pushing mid that can roam at six, then like it could be that you nullify their entire draft with a single ward and and just backing off in a defensive play. So I think that that like the early game is super important until it isn't important at all. Once you can do these like very simple things uh, that I think involve like defensive play and offensive play, uh, then the mid game is where the complexity and the punishment of these plays really comes to fruition in the full complexity of like how it is that you use tempo. And I think that though it's from my I mean, experience if they last use the year, word to back up like, I top. obviously, I obviously like thought the same as you in May last year. And my experience was that, I don't think that I can catch up to SKT by training early game. I don't think that I can catch up to them this year by 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 focusing my efforts on an optimized early game. And I certainly don't want to win by like just kind of like barely holding on with a 10k gold lead and then losing all games that are even. So I'm not saying yeah. that that's the only way to do it. You are. Um, I'm saying that you can train an early game really well and you can get extremely far by building a foundation off of early game and then transition a lot of that by starting to add mid game principles. And I, I also think that there, there's many. The I actually, I actually got to talk no matter to. What. Well, I actually got to talk to Michael Redmond. I don't know if either of you are familiar with that name, but he was the one that did the Alpha Goal versus Lee Sedol uh, analytical commentary. Um, I actually got to talk with him on his approach to go, and I, I've spoken with chess players as well, um, in the sense that you you look at end game to early game, and even he had that approach. I mean, this is okay. similarly. Okay. In, in, let's right. let's 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 d define a distinction between chess and League of Legends. First of all, so a lot sure. of the things about chess and like go is because these games have been played so many times and they haven't really changed that much and innovations like to an extent to some of these plays right. have been like very limited so you can think of like chess as like an open system in game theory right um so to an extent i feel like league of legends and other competitive games are like uh, to, that change are more of a closed system because you're not going to necessarily have all of the information about the other team's prep or what they're doing or what they're setting up or like there will be gaps in information and so being able to focus on and getting like early game advantages can matter like so much more in a game like League of Legends than a game like chess but in Go the pieces aren't placed yet the board okay. starts off empty this is actually something I specifically talked about with Redmond when trying to compare league with uh go because I, I was so mesmerized i guess by his analysis and how alpha go approached the game um and just watching the entire match unfold um would you argue or would you agree 
that the least changed part of League of Legends since its creation has been the endgame. I mean... Let's see. I think that... I, I don't necessarily agree with it, because I think that people have found out more in terms of, like, evolving their understanding of early game more. So I don't necessarily think that, like, clearly I'm, I'm talking about... Of it. But, like, Dragon, sure, like, right. inhibitors still exist, but they've changed the way that, like, super minions flow, for example. Right. And I think that's, like, key. But what stage they've, of the game suffers the most change? Um, early game, but I think that being able to constantly think about early game and how the changes are and how you can adapt as a team is exercising a different skill set that can give you a competitive advantage. Okay, but then you're always having to stay ahead of the curve. But okay. that's something, but that's a competitive advantage that you can invest in so, as a team. I think this actually ties into the Samsung White point as well. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a good time to come back to that. Um, so I, the way that I like to see League of Legends is as an elite uh, at the pro level. Even though it's in an, an entertainment industry on the mm -hmm. business side, it is an elite performance sport because it uses a motor movement, uh, essentially. So it makes it fundamentally different from... Uh, things like chess in the sporting aspect, although in the strategy aspect, that's that's like an economics discussion, I think, or a game theory discussion. Um, but if we look at, like, how long would you say it takes to become a grandmaster at chess, training deliberately with what we know about the game, so you have really concrete training methods that we know create you into a chess master. You can do this in violin, too. You can take a person, you can say, these are the training methods that if you follow these and you're focused on them and you're in the zone, you will get to be this level of violinist uh, if you're like an average human being. So, so like, if we if we say that we know that we can start six-year-olds and that, it, like, anywhere from 18 to 23, they can hit the level of ELO necessary to, like, start qualifying for uh, challenging grandmasters, then we say that it's, like, like a 15 to a 20 year span or at the most like at the least like 10 years to like learn the patterns of chess in an embedded way that you can like scale yourself up to that complexity so let's say that league is at least as complex as chess in terms of strategy that means that like it would take if we knew if we were had been playing league for thousands of years and we knew like the perfect form of league of legends it would take league of legends players literally you know 10 to 15 years to get to the level of complexity and strategy uh that the grandmasters of league of legends at that time would be able to play with where they would just see things on the map and they would instantly know the answers I mean, and, and the like they could is... see five or six moves into the future right or 10 moves into the future and, and play the game in their head so so the problem is the game hasn't actually been around even that long right so the game is literally evolving so much every single year that not only are the people at the forefront trying to learn the game, which is true of all sports, but they're also pushing it to this point where it will become a solved system in the future. And that's one of the reasons, by the way, I say that League of Legends is a game of errors and that Samsung White would lose horribly to teams today because yes, they were really good at early game. At the time that they were there, they were the best team in the world in terms of the difference in power level between their conception of the, how to play the game and everybody I mean, below I don't them. even agree with that, but yes. Okay. But if you're making but, this principle, but I but, think that, like, that doesn't matter because they would be worse now at the principles that actually win the game because we have discovered those and now we're training them. And if we just suck them up from the past and planted them here in the future and, like, had them play, you know, SKT and KT, they would probably get shit off. But if Samsung White was so convinced that those were the principles that won the game, right, and those were what they trained, and you're arguing that they were the best team, right, and they were ahead of all these other teams, then, like, why are we so convinced now? And the game has evolved, and we've evolved our understanding of the game, and we still have to wait hundreds of years before we have perfect Master League of Legends. Why are we now arguing that our understanding, or that your understanding, that mid to late... Because it's advanced. Point? We're talking... Hold because on, it's... but see, this is interesting, because I lived with Samsung from their birth. I was there when all the players got invited. I got to see how they coached. I got to see how they talked. I got to see how they became Samsung. They didn't do it by approaching the early games. They didn't. Sure, but their early game decision making was much better than their late game decision. But that was because the emphasis of their their talks the, was actually the beauty that I to the beauty that I saw in their play was that they could draft literally any champion and know how they wanted to play it, which comes from understanding the core principles of the game which i don't think 
necessarily happen except when you're engaging in like game ending complex like composition on composition fights yeah but then over, they would just like draft stuff the game, like, that made no sense and they would lose so i mean like you can you i think samsung white at this point is really over romanticized like you could literally say anything positive about that team and everyone will just agree with you mm -hmm. um because no one even remembers how that team played or what they did and i think it's like a bit ludicrous to say that whatever they draft they knew how to play and they could play it perfectly because there were games where they just drafted like really random shit and then they lost so like i just i mean so to an ex i bring up this example because you brought it up as an example of a team that played really well. And I think that, that like their early game was much better trained and more disciplined in general than their mid game. So. Well, like, here, here's the, here's the, uh, here's the thing. Um, pro, uh, a pro mobile player. I mean, we see it in first person shooters as well. Why can pros from other FPSs or pro MOBAs, if a new game came out, let's say a, a random new MOBA came out, a mediocre League of Legends player could go to that game and probably perform it in a very high level. Because it's significantly easier for them to learn the, the early stages of the game. Everything that goes into the early parts of it. Because they understand, the, they understand the core principles of the mid and late. They understand what makes a MOBA. I mean, right? I think that like you also can argue that there are a lot of core principles that are the same in early games across multiple MOBAs. So, like, I mean, just if you compare Dota, it's like, okay, you're adding the fact that you're, to an extent, denying CS, and then the map is larger, and then, like, all, but, like, these are permutations of things, and it's not even just, like, MOBAs, right? You have, like, FPSs, all these other games that have certain permutations that you can adapt from one game to the other, and I wouldn't say that it's just occurring in mid and late game. But would, wouldn't you agree, though, that it's interesting how the, the the pros can swap games and be instantly good. Yeah, but I don't necessarily think it's just because like mid and late game has taught them how to play early game in other games. Like I right, like that claim. right. It, it doesn't mean that it's taught them how to play early game, but early game is significantly easier to solve than mid and late. Okay, so then train that first, use it as a foundation, and then train the rest because like as long as they no, it's a waste of time it's a waste of time to train it it's an absolute waste of time to train it because you, could be, training you, that? That. you could be training more complex principles and you can just say like you guys need to do this right like you died here don't die it's really easy I to mean, figure out how not to die you ward at that time and you back off like no i simple. don't think that's that's not that's not early game early game is just isn't just die don't die early game is identify where your composition okay, has yeah sure then you can then you can do pressure and, and you can you can take pressure lanes and you can start transferring them around and and that's fine you can train how to do that but like why yeah, would you train how to do to that to to when why would you train how to do that when you're going to win more games by training mid game i don't think we've established early. that we're we're winning more games by training mid game i don't think we've established I think that, that you do true. i think that if you train mid early game you only learn how to win if you're ahead mid game you only learn how to win the game if you're ahead mid game you don't learn how to do proper comeback plays so you're what was TS, I mean, we, we can use a lot of examples here. How, like sure. th there were there were a lot of examples. Uh, I mean, not just in League of Legends, but also in uh, again other esports titles, etc. Where you can be ahead. Like w so, if you're ahead early game, you look at your win ratio percentage, right? And then look at if you're even in mid game, or if you're even in late game, or if you're behind in early game, and then look at all the win statistics. I don't think that there's necessarily a correlation. Uh, I mean, there is a higher percent. Like, if you're ahead, there is, like yeah. at 50 if you're ahead, minutes, you win more games. There is, you if you, if you're ahead early on, yes, you, you win more games. But then there's also a lot of context that needs yeah. to be applied. Look at TSM, right? Weren't they always ahead or something? Uh, yeah, but that was domestically. That was domestically. domestically. I think, sure. and then the one... Okay, so also if we're going to talk about TSM. And so why like, was that, Western, though? Western teams that beat Samsung Galaxy, okay? Team Solo Mid managed to be take a game off of them by playing like an early game and taking advantage of a Samsung of one of Samsung's mistakes in early as well. So like I think that if sure. you're just and then we lost about, the other game because yeah, you of lost mid game, game instincts, mid game I principles. I think that you lost the other in. game because about, they played their early game much better. If you look at those games and you break down, they played like, their early game. Up the Nile, fine, for example, right? like that was the game 
that was the game, okay, where the enemy mid of all of the games at Worlds that TSM played and all of the games at I Am Oakland that TSM played, that was the game, that one game, the Samsung game where Bjergsen got solo killed was the game where the enemy mid got the largest percentage of the first blue buffs spawning of any mid lane, of any game where the enemy, like, so, like, so Bjergsen this is exactly my point, Kelsey. Let's say that you spend months repetitively training this like core way of winning the game and in, in, in the snowballing fashion. And then in the one important game that actually fucking matters, your so you mid laner just accidentally gets solo killed by like just luck. Just like the luck that's of sport. Luck. He that's catches a, a that's spill like chip. an actual strategy that Samsung prevented you from tearing off in the early game, which is denying the enemy blue buff. You see TSM okay, still then, kind of does And then like, and then so he dies, right? So he has one death, right? And then that's it. We lose the early game because we can't snowball, and then we, by default, lose the mid-game because we can't actually play the mid-game because it wasn't... I mean, we can play the mid-game. We trained it a ton, but I'm saying train it more than the early game because one mistake can undo... All the time you invested in training how to snowball in early game can be undone I by can't. one unlucky situation in the early game. Why like one, one the situation, the right? Time Whereas, like, in the, in the principles in the mid-game, whether it's a comeback play or, like, a, or like a come-from-ahead play, like... Like, all of those matter. All of those matter whether you're behind or whether you're ahead. And so those are the skills that I believe that are fundamental to, like, winning the game. Whereas, like, getting a lead just is a, is a really... First I don't know, all, I think it's a really bad way to play. I think it's a really bad way to, like, train. Sorry, it's a really good way to play, of course. You should always get a lead. But I think it's a really bad way to focus on... The I'll, I'll use myself get, uh, as get an this, example. Like, get this concept really where you're... Of, okay, concept. okay. You know wait, 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 hold on. First, Let me just... wait, wait, wait. You're going letter, to letter. support his argument, LS? So no, no, no. You're allowed to do that, which this is, is like fine. A debate. But, I'm not, I'm not... I'm going to throw something in that is, like, I can speak about um, really quick, literally two minutes, and then you offer your rebuttal to him, and then we, we go from there. I'm not trying to necessarily take sides, but I'm trying to use history. Um, MLG Dallas 2010, Blizzard released a patch the day of that made my early game Terran versus Zerg build not possible anymore. And it was something that I used to get to the mid game consistently with an advantage to consistently cripple Zergs. And then with that, I would glide out the game with timing attacks and I'd win the game. I went up against Idra in MLG Dallas. I lost one, two in a best of three. I could not use my build. And so because of that, it, we, the games got to stages where I didn't know what the fuck to do and he did. And that can yeah, happen in week. If you're constantly thinking, okay, so I will address your point first and then I'll address yeah. Weldon's, thank you. Your point, okay. So, yes. first, if you're constantly thinking about training and adapting to early game, you're not just thinking about one early game strategy and tunnel visioning on one early game strategy. That's not like a very exciting way to, that's not like a very accurate or very correct way, in my opinion, to continue to like focus on early game training or to train early game. Like, training early game involves training early game defense, it involves in training like multiple compositions and how to play them. And, and this is like the core principle that I'm getting at is depending on the comp, you need to be able to train multiple compositions, multiple types of compositions that have different power spikes in different types of situations. And so, if you're saying that like we're not going to train compositions that need that rely on like early game snowball i think that that's like an oversight and the way that your composition plays and the way that you draft can vary greatly on how like you're going to do your strategy and to me that matters much more than breaking the game down into phases and deciding like training a specific type of comp optimally is what i think you need to be focused on like the most okay so I think that that's like one thing. And then of course you can use examples like I think teams that are really good at the early game, like H2K, Flash Wolves were probably the best early game teams at the World Championship, arguably. And they still managed to adapt really, really effectively to a lack of lane swaps, even though those were things that you can look at Flash Wolves and H2K strategy and how they altered really drastically. And then you come back and you say, well, Flash Wolves didn't get out of groups, but you still see like how effective and how strong and how good their early game was. And that it could even like 
allow them to take a game off of SKT. So, like, I'm not arguing you should be Flash Wolves at all, but I think it's, like, unfair to dismiss, like, how effective their early game was and say that, like, it's not important. Um, so the other point, going back to Team Solo mid, like, you can also spend all of this time playing mid-game and training mid-game, right? And then just, like, spend the entire season training mid-game. And maybe you're against teams that have, like, really, really bad mid-game understanding or really bad mid-game principles, right? And then when you make a mid-game mistake or something that you refer to as an unlucky mistake in the mid-game, you're still going to end up, like, in a situation where you're losing off of that, only worse, because you spent all this time, like, training mid-game and you're saying, okay, mid-game mistakes are more punishing, and so if, like, something that you refer to as unlucky happens, then that's, like, even worse for you, because you aren't not necessarily as focused on being able to get, a, you don't have a lead, right, that's going to help you out. You haven't trained how to, like, get a lead if the lead isn't important, and then you make this mid-game decision-making because something happens that you refer to as unlucky, or something that the enemy team has trained in mid-game that isn't really part of your region or part of the training that you've done and so like you make that mistake you don't have the early lead to fall back on right you because you didn't train early like you've decided that building an early lead isn't important the other thing that i want to talk about is that i don't necessarily think that like the fact that he got that blue buff like samsung galaxy managed to deny team solo mid's strategy of denying blue buffs right was necessarily let's say a, a bad thing or excuse an unlucky, excuse me, it was necessarily an unlucky mistake because what you have in those particular situations is you have um, a team, Samsung Galaxy, identifying what Team Solo Mid does, right? Which is they do place a lot of emphasis on like denying the enemy their blue buff. If they're able to like react to that and make sure that <coughs> um, their mid laner is able to, to pick up the blue buffs or more shares of the blue buffs and then like Bjergsen is not used to playing against that pressure that's not necessarily an unlucky thing that's a mistake that Team Solo Mid have in their strategy that they haven't necessarily trained well in their early game so you need to be able to identify mistakes that you're making in early game even if your competition is weak you need to be able to identify mistakes you're making in mid game even if your competition is weak and I don't necessarily think that's going to change depending on what uh, phase of the game you're training. What about H2K versus Samsung Galaxy? The Yankos game on Olaf. Uh, the, uh, okay, the Yankos game on Olaf where they snowballed where they, against Samsung Galaxy. They got an insane advantage. Yes. Okay. And if we, we can probably fairly make the statement that had you given SK Telecom or the Rocks Tigers that advantage, Samsung would have died probably sooner. But Samsung end up winning the game. But why is that? Samsung Galaxy ended up winning the game. And again, I think that like H2K's mid game is actually just really bad. Like, so that's why I'm advocating like, and their late game is actually just really bad. And it's consistently been like that, which is why I'm not necessarily advocating like right. always just training one part of the game. Like if you do that, you end up as H2K or you end up as Flash Wolves, but you still see those teams, even though their mid game is like really abysmal, able to take games off of teams that maybe aren't as focused on uh, mid game and maybe even like for example, like RNG is another good example, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's like, <clears throat> I don't think you can necessarily ignore the effectiveness that they've been able to have with that just because like you're saying and say that mid game is less important. Is uh, well, I'm, not, I'm, not saying, I'm, I'm not saying that the early game is not important, but I'm saying that clearly teams with better mid late games would have won the game. And I don't think that's necessarily or, I mean, well, you with better, say, like, better early game. Okay, so so let's game. like it would be sure. it would be a better. So um, be better um, actually, to make a more complete comparison. It would be better to make a more complete comparison and say teams with okay, better mid games, but slightly worse early games. Okay, so, so like slightly better mid games, slightly worse early game. So it's like about finding that good balance, right? Where I think H, you can argue H2K trained way too much mid game, right? They train way way too much mid game. I mean, not mid game, early game. Sorry. They train way too much early game. So, like, going back, I think it's really possible to train way too much mid-game. And then, like, again, as I said, you make a mid-game mistake, okay? <laughs> and then you're able to go ahead and uh, 
you, you have this problem and you, because you didn't necessarily acquire a lead, this make game mistake is going to be more punishing. Whereas if you have trained more early game, then you'll probably, or you could have a larger lead at that point and be able to like have that to fall back on if maybe your make game training mistakes are, are not as strong. So I think it's like about acquiring a balance. And I don't think you can definitively say that like one phase of the game is more important to train. And that is my point. In a supercomputer world, Wait, right? Good. Yeah. Well, I just want Kelsey in, in a supercomputer world, right? Not in a human world. Sure. Mm -hmm. Weldon, would you agree with that? In, in a supercomputer I, I, world. I, I didn't argue a supercomputer world point, I don't think, because I'm I'm acknowledging for the possibility. Well, I think I think we can say, say the loss. Yeah, I think we could say in a human philosophical world. Uh, we, we're both agreed that that's the state that we're in. I think uh, I really like the idea you had of saying like, um, yeah, if you if you're training for early game or you're training for twenty to forty, you have to be able to visualize a better opponent. Period, because that doesn't let us off the hook for failing in the early game uh, at Worlds with TSM, right? That we should have if we trained it uh, extensively, we should have been able to pull out a lot of those a lot of those victories. Um, however, I I do believe that training early game comps, so the point about different styles of compositions is rather pointless. Like, I don't think there is such a thing as an early game comp. I think there's an unbalanced cheese comp, but I think that, like, if you're really, really good at the game, you draft the strongest style of winning the game, which is that you have a composition that is strong at, like, makes trade-offs at all phases of the game, and, and all ends a little bit more on the phase of the game that is strongest at the current moment. So, in the current meta, I think that that is uh, mid game between 20 and 40, and I think that that is where comps should come online in terms of their team fighting and their pressure, and that they shouldn't rely completely on um, early game to like get to that point because I think that you can allow for some forgiveness there in terms of like making mistakes and and still take the game off it. So I think I think that I just really I just really don't like the feeling of training like spending a lot of training time choreographing early game pressure snowballing and then have seen the team walk on stage and like like getting that blue buff stolen and then having it nullify literally like weeks of training in front of my face right so i think that for a team that is not yet a world championship team if you're thinking like all we need to do we don't need to get good i we mean to, i'm i can't imagine up, I'd... right we need to we need to like the only thing we're doing is trying to get to the top right so we want to take the shortest possible route there shortcut and like i don't we don't really it doesn't like a tournament is essentially just there's one winner everybody else loses right so i don't really care about how far we get in worlds and all the stuff that people are pining about like everybody lost to skt that is it period so and like the goal is to beat them and i want to take the shortest path possible to them of course it's represented by tests along the way like group stages and semifinals and quarterfinals and all this could be pointless if we don't even make worlds this year would you do but um also keep in mind i'm speaking for myself by the way like uh, i'm on g2 and off g2 basically every other week because i work in finland as well and so uh, i want to make sure that this doesn't isn't reflected in the g2 brand like my personal philosophy because they have a head coach i'm an assistant coach right and we have these debates but it's not like i'm steering the sales um as i was kind of like more more pushing a little bit more forward towards the TSM, but that was just because Parth and I had a really, really good relationship there. So I think that I think that, like I said, it feels really bad to see those situations where all of our early game training becomes nullified. And so I think that it is smarter if you're on the trying to take a trajectory path at the top that you train a part of the game that you're always going to get to play, even if you're behind or ahead. Uh, whereas, like if you train snowballing in the early game and then you get put on the defense. You literally don't get to use any of those skills. I think they're just, they're pretty much just latent while you're playing defense, which is a completely separate set of skills in the early game. Whereas I think in the mid game, I think that like you can use tempo to get into an offensive state once your comp comes online, if you don't have too big a, de a deficit. And you can play in a slightly more equal state once you kind of group up and, and you have the threat of four people there. It's not a skirmish anymore. And so you have the threat of four people there that kind of puts the opposing team a little bit on guard, even though they might have a two or three K uh, lead. So I, I'm still of the opinion that mid game is just 
in this meta, like mid game, I keep saying mid game, 15 to 20 to 35 and 40 minutes. I think it's just better to train in terms of like a coach's perspective on, on how to get a team up there. Cause I still believe that pros should be on the hook for a lot of the early game themselves. Like they should come into their job in the gaming house and they should spend their time in solo queue to achieve a lot of the skill set necessary for the laning phase. They should be studying their own scrimmages and stuff like that. We shouldn't be wasting team time on those kind of individual things. So a lot of, a lot of the little moves in early game can just be like thrown out in, in scrims because of, because of those kinds of mistakes. So I, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I agree with kind of like the direction of your thought, but I still think that we fundamentally disagree on like whether or not you should spend training time there. Because I think that my experience has been that it's a frustrating endeavor that is guaranteed to slow you down. And it's not going to guarantee to make you lose. You're still going to get better at the game and you're going to win a ton mm -hmm. and stuff, but you're not going to catch up to Korea and beat them if you just train the early game only. No one is Whereas advocating just, just training the early right, game only. Sorry, sorry. So if you train the early game and the mid game, and I think that like, it's just, I think it's too, I mean, obviously you're doing a scrim, right? So like we always train the early game, but in those 20 minutes, I apportion, I would say you apportion a vast majority of that to the fundamental mistakes that you, that you do in the mid game. And then you go to the first failure, first point of failure in early game and you tackle it. And that way you move the first point of failure forward and you focus your strategy and tactical training on movements in, in in the early game sorry in the in the 20 to 40. so i i mean like i really agree with the first failure approach and in tsm we did the first failure approach where we would always train our first failure and try to extend it and then we also spent a lot of time on other early game like chore choreographies such as like when the first turret fell and whether we go late you know mid or top and and it was the tendencies in some teams is like uh i want to say uh automated they they take a turret and they just immediately walk to some lane without even thinking about it because they they obviously clearly didn't ever train early game like extensively in terms of theory crafting it and so they don't even know how to properly do lane assignments after after the first turret falls and like they could spend a lot of time trying to drill that those things into the team but that still involves being on the offense and actually getting the first turret or otherwise that skill is is kind of nullified you just have to react to what the stronger opponent is doing and play defensively well there so I, I think that I, I still am not convinced that I would train, change my training method in, in order to reflect more and more early game focus. I still think that it's better to let the domestic teams like teach us early game through scrims and through first failure points and just like through getting beat up and train the fundamentals of, of how to win the game with pressure and tempo in the mid game. And then after halfway through the split, start refining and, and what, not a halfway through the split. I'm putting that timeline out there like feliciously, but it should be after you you're, you see that your player's instincts are more or less in line and they have the, the best instincts and they know how to uh, how to play our core compositions, you know, with a with either a pressure top or a carry top or a tank top, um, you know, or and then the winning mid and bot or whatever, a side laning bot or one three one, however you want to say it. Uh, depending on how we draft, like they should be able to like play those comps out in the mid game and then learn how to get advantages in the early game in order to to make them come online well. Because I I I guess that I think our fundamental differences or one of them uh, we have a ton of similarities, right? But is that there is such a thing as early game comps? I think that like it's okay for teams to draft that if they know that they're not as good as the other team and they can't play meta. And, or they can't play perfect League of Legends, so they have to all in on a certain phase of the game and try to like snowball it out. Or like Samsung Galaxy, where they would all in on, on late game drafts and they would just like try to survive until that point and, and win that way. I think that's also a weakness. So I think that that's un, unbalanced. And I really want to win like fully, right. just by being better. right? Not by think, being better at one facet. When I say early game comp, I don't necessarily mean a comp that's going to be bad in mid and late. I mean a comp that will have multiple pushing lanes. Okay, so yeah, so like a balanced comp that has early okay. game tendencies, the, the, right? The, ar the right. arguments are, okay. are... that makes sense. The arguments I mean, the, are beginning to repeat. Yeah, the arguments are yeah. repeating themselves, yeah. so like, should we do closing statements? Yeah, let me, let me just ask uh, a few questions to, to both of you uh, really quickly, right? Okay. Um, 
So Kelsey, um, if you have an early game centric team, right, and you are a professional uh, team coach or team owner, et cetera, right, and you see that you know your mid laner dies. Uh, let's say you're an early game team, actually, and you're mm -hmm. the team of an early. Uh, you own an early game team, and your early game for some reason goes terribly. Okay. You would feel a lot worse because that's your strongest point. Because now, as the game continues to draw on, you would get more anxious, wouldn't you? Yeah, but you shouldn't. If you're training I mean, more think, than other teams, you should I think. That. I think that if you're training, if you're, I think the same can be true for a mid-game team. So I don't really fully understand the point of the question. Like, if you're a mid-game team and well, because then you the, don't get get a laid yeah, early sure. game, and then you make a mistake mid-game, you're still going to feel like really bad. Right, so. but the game keeps going towards the end, which is where your team is meant to scale. I Not mean, scale in a, in a team comp sense. I mean that that's where you're supposed to be more practiced. I mean, if you make a mistake and... Okay, so you're supposed to be more practiced early, and then would as you, the Would you feel... Goes, so, like, are you arguing that, like, it's worse to be an early game-centric team because you'll feel bad for longer until you lose? Like, I'm not really sure what the point of your question is. I'm, I'm asking, would you feel more comfortable being a late game-centric team the, the longer that the game... Like, even if your team gets behind early, as long as the mm -hmm. clock keeps ticking, don't you feel more comfortable? If, you're, if you have a team... Okay, so... Are you asking about whether or not I have a team that scales better than the opposing team? Not like a team. Or if a team that has like trained more late game. A, t a team that has trained more mid-late game transition. Okay. They fall behind early. You still don't feel super bad. Because you they feel like behind. you have insurance. Yeah, I mean, if you feel like you haven't... If you've trained more late game, then that's the advantage. But at the same time, if you're that type of team that... Like, if you fall behind super hard early, you're still going to feel anxious and and a lot of anxiety, even if you have trained. Like, right, but you the, game is, the game is moving insurance. to a point where those objective things, like the minions beginning to mm -hmm. threaten turrets, etc., those become real things as the duration draws on. I'm not saying that if you, like, I'm not, if you train early game, it's not like you've never seen a Baron before, or you've never seen a, right. a super minion wave before. I mean, I think that you still have, like, the ability to make decisions, and if you, like, arguably, okay, you make a mistake in the early game, so maybe you don't get a lead, as big of a lead as you want, and you're against a team that's, like, more mid or late game focused, you still have, like, a lead, and you still are able to, because you've trained certain aspects, be able to identify where your strengths are, and so you're still able to play to that. I don't think, like, you're going to be fundamentally screwed over. Um, I also think that teams that, when they are training in the early game, like they understand to an extent lane pressure very well. Mm -hmm. um, so they're able to like push, continue keeping up side wave momentum. And I think like those types of teams are more likely to react. Like if a team goes for Baron, I think those types of teams are more likely to react to like push a lane, right? And then have to force like the team to make a call where they have to pull off Baron or react to the trade. And so I think those types of like, I think that's a principle that you see well, more early game focused teams making than like, which I think is really interesting and a different way to like spread out the map and use that pressure because they've trained like how to get multiple lanes ahead or how to use pressure off multiple lanes in the early game as opposed to teams that like focus much more on building like team compositions that team fight or try to bait at Baron or things like this. Okay. So I think like this is an interesting interaction as well. Last question I have for you and then we'll all ask Weldon and then we have closing statements, I guess. Is that fine? Okay. okay. Historically across multiple titles, why has China never beaten Korea despite their emphasis on early game? I mean, I think that Ch China has a lot more problems. I think, than just on laning. Than I think China <laughs> has a much more of problems than just what stage of the game they emphasize. Like, let's put it that way. Sure, um, but would we agree they have an emphasis on early game? I don't actually agree, no. actually. If you watch uh, China, I'm saying games, multiple titles, not just, like, recent league. I'm saying, like, oh, other... Oh, oh. I'm not as... <laughs> Able to, like I don't even necessarily think that's true because I think you can look at multiple titles where China has played um, much differently, right? If you have like Dota, Dota Two historically was like, or Dota historically was like 
Chinese teams actually tried to stall out the game really hard, right? And just like put a lot of gold onto a, a number one or a carry or things like this. Mm -hmm. So like the that's like completely different. I also think that in League of Legends, Chinese teams, especially if you look at them right now, they've like f emphasized fundamentals of team fighting much more. So that means that they won't necessarily draft lanes to just like kill you super hard. Um, okay. And they'll do that type of thing. So I don't necessarily think that like China's problem is that they focus too much on early game, or even that I would say that they focus too much on early game. I think you've seen like a lot of the top Chinese teams focus on early game, but I don't think as a region. Like you say, that's the truth. Like for example, EDG, I think, is a very a much more early game focused philosophy. But if you look at um, maybe some different or RNG, RNG sure. probably most definitely is like an early game focused philosophy team. But if you look at some other types of teams, like EDG historically, like 2014 EDG, absolutely like the opposite. Team WE, absolutely kind of the opposite. Um, so, would you agree though that it's harder to close? A game out. Harder to close a game out if you have an early game lead. No. It. Well, uh, um, is it easier to get a lead or close a game? Just in general. Easier to get a lead, or I mean, it depends on like what you you practice. I think. So. Okay. Um. Well then. Uh. I guess uh, the yeah. What you look like you wanted to is, say. Something. Sorry. What is the really question? Quick. No, no. You just looked like you wanted to say something. No, no, I was, you said my name. Oh, and, okay. Uh, I was listening. So I guess the, 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 the question I have for you is going back to one of the original points. Um, the early game where you're saying that you don't feel like the advantages obtained in it are worthwhile enough to put more emphasis on that area of the game than mid and late. Yes. Right? Okay. And this is now. But if if we I think, agree the, I think that domestically, I think domestically, I'm not. I'm not talking get, domestic. I'm saying if we agree that there are supercomputers, philosophically, though. right? But if so there's super okay, so supercomputers. Mm, no, I think it's. I think in league. I think in league, league of Legends, like philosophically, it's easy enough to play defense with fewer resources mm -hmm. to nullify really hard snowballs, and most teams that get snowballed against by by early tendency compositions are not playing defense well enough. And so okay. it's actually their mistake in defense that is causing them to lose, which they could get by training the early game more, yes. But I think that that starts with priorities of how it is to play out the mid game and then moves into early game defense once you square away that direction. Because we tried it the I tried it the other way and I didn't like the feeling of it. It felt like we were learning the game backwards, essentially, in my opinion. Okay. And I guess we'll transition, I guess, into closing arguments. I thought of an analogy I could make with, uh, what is it, triathlons, right? Isn't there, like, there's three different types of, uh, am I thinking of the right thing? There's three different types of things there's to that race? Bike, swim, right. bike, and run. Yeah, you swim yeah there's, bike, there's bike, running, and, okay. All right, but I, I can't. I don't think I, I don't think I can be concise enough with it, so I'm not going to go into it to, to ask you a question on that. Um, but okay, I guess now we'll just hear closing statements. Uh, the, the statement about triathlons is that you can you cannot win the game in the swim. Sorry, you cannot win a triathlon by training swimming, but you can lose it. So you train swimming just enough not to lose, and then you train biking and running. That's that's the quote about triathlon. So that's kind of the analogy, I guess, if you want to apply that to my. Uh, yeah, that that that's actually what I was going to. Uh, All right, that's a better way to put it. Yeah. Okay. Now I guess we'll just transition into to closing statements. That was that's my closing argument. League is a okay. triathlon, then. I guess that would be okay. it. You train you train uh, swimming just enough not to lose, and then you uh, you become a runner and a biker. And if you're a swimmer, then you probably should become a runner. I think uh, it's it's, it's important to contextualize. Yeah. Is the swimming less duration than the running and the biking? It's because yeah, that would tie in, less. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a really bad analogy. It's okay, pathetically yeah. bad. It would it would ha they would have to be context of a okay. useful analogy, sure. but it's a similar okay. structured sport to the way that I see League of Legends, and it's way way less distance. 
if you think about it. Like it's so a thousand meters swimming. So let's say you have twenty thousand meters biking and ten thousand meters walking. So it's like literally a scale of one tenth, one twentieth of importance. So let's say you have Michael Phelps versus you know, Billy Moe in Twitch chat in the swim. Obviously, Michael Phelps is going to finish the swimming portion. Yeah. Right? But then uh, Billy Moe is a if great the runner. If they're the same skill biking. at running and biking, then Phelps wins. Okay. Yeah, if they're the same skill. If they're the same so skill. So obviously... But yeah, if Billy if Moe is slightly skill. better at biking and running, you're suggesting Billy Moe wins. Oh, yeah. Easily. You get, okay. like, a couple seconds uh, lead from swimming like 15 seconds sure okay. In a, in a 1K. against phelps right. you get you get way less than that i mean you get crushed you get okay. massacred but i'm okay. assuming that billy may billy mo billy mo yeah i'm looking for him in the chat uh, i'm assuming that billy mo like at least trained swimming enough not to lose that's okay. most of his time okay and i guess actually before kelsey get kelsey uh do you have any comment so what, on that triathlon what analogy? is the uh, what is the opposite analogy for for Kelsey's viewpoint, uh, basically that it's like it's equilateral, right? That's that, the way that I was perceiving it. But I, I need to hear her closing. Mid game and early game yeah. is equally as important, and then that you can train mid game, you can train holistic principles from the early game that apply like completely to the game. So, okay. I mean, I think that you train the advantage just, that is going to get you the most. I mean, in this particular situation is what I would argue. Um, like, I think that there is, especially if you look at the economic principles of like competitive advantage in game theory, there's definitely always going to be, because you have limited resources, which is something that you have to uh, identify, like you will necessarily look at the part where, okay, even if, like, even if you have a team that's, let's say SKT is better at early game and mid and late game than you, right? They're going to train the one that they're the best at, or they're going to, like, get the most out of that one. Whereas if you're going to be, like, almost as good at them at early, you can train, why, like, try to try to train early better. And get why wouldn't they train the one that you're worst at? Um, because I think that the amount of gains of the ones that you're worse, worst at, like you can gain a certain amount, but you have to realize that what you're training is okay. relative to an ecosystem that already exists, right? It's relative to this type of situation. And I think that you can make certain competitive advantages, like give you a head start and a foundation as you continue to develop and other things. And I think overlooking what's already like within the cultural framework, within the foundation of like, say Europe or China or uh, North America. And we're looking at like what these players and what these teams are already kind of good at and like overlooking the foundation that that can give us just because like this Korean team has had more success training something else, I, I think is necessarily, not necessarily going to to give you like the best foundation for growing your esport uh, competitively for being better in the long run because you need to be able to like latch onto something that you can get an advantage with. You need to be able to latch on, on something that's going to, to get, to make you competitive in a certain regard before like you can begin to build off of everything, I think. And that's like, Especially in a situation where we're feel a lot of teams are feeling discouraged and things like this. Like I think you can get a lot more out of training something where they can get an advantage, where they can begin to build and where they can have an opportunity to to win. Because you do start to get like these narrow advantages. And as soon as like you can use that to even almost break the mental block to an extent against these teams, I think training the other aspects become easier. I think training like the how to play the game optimally, like because I don't think any of us are arguing that the optimal way to play a game varies uh, by anything other than necessarily like composition. There will be a correct choice, right, um, in, in within the game. So I just think that like you, it's, I actually it's really think that's a really that's a really valid point. I think that like. The idea of like uh, becoming better at a specific facet of the game in order to, to push that kind of like break the scene out of complacency, and that might actually rejuvenate motivation then on other portions of the game and allow catch up to happen more swiftly. But I think that it's also disregarding scrimmages. Like, while it's true that like if you look at the actual competitions, there's 
an overwhelming amount of like wins on the Korean side. I don't think that any pro players that I've ever worked with have had a mental block around Korean players. Maybe G2 a little bit. Facing international I mean, teams. But that was just like one match. Who, seemed, who at least seemed to have a mental block. Like, I mean, but, I can't determine because I'm not in, not in their head, right? Sure. But like, at least who will regard Korean there are, there are almost as like this that, other that human, can't. right? Yeah, there so, are people that believe that they can't get as good as that person at the game. Yes. Right. But I think that like... I don't know. I, I don't. I don't think that when I we, feel, I feel when like we it, it have scrimmages against Korean teams that they, they feel. I mean, we beat them a lot. They beat us a lot. It's. I think. Uh, I think that they have a very high, a higher probability way of winning, which means that they come out on top. Would we? Would we agree that what is occurring in early, mid, and late are like different? Right. Early game is mechanics. Lane manipulation. Well, lane manipulation occurs at mid and late, right? But there, there's mechanics. Early game lane manipulation, early game ward timing, early game tracking of junglers. I mean, I right? think you add variables, but right. I think that it, like you build off of existing variables. But I think it is kind of a mistake to think of them as like necessarily separated, because I think you obviously have to change the way that you're thinking about them. But I don't necessarily yeah. like. I think the way that I think you of it use as a series of pushing power issues. and react, right. and you react to pressure and things of that nature isn't going to necessarily change just because there's a, a different a time period in the game. And I think that you can expand off of these like types of core principles that you gain through the early game. Okay. So. I, I feel like this argument, it, though, it, it goes in a never-ending circle. If you can say that you can be that much better at an early game, yes, it's easier to transition that lead and get advantages in the mid and then ultimately in the later stages of the game, right? But if you're that much better at the mid game than the other team is at the early game, then that would assume that you're also prepared to handle certain deficits that they're expecting to, to have. You're prepared to handle certain deficits, but that also like if you do that, you have to be prepared to make to to react to like so many more mistakes or even like put the ball in their court to make the mistakes, I think, if you're doing that. And so like but I would always rather like look at a game and say that um I'm assume I'm not going to assume my opponent will necessarily make mistakes, which is why I do think that training early game can be extremely powerful. So, well, if we assume that our opponents won't make mistakes, then why do we assume that you can get advantages early on? Because if your draft, like there will necessarily be like, if you draft an early specialization, like a comp that has like multiple pushing lanes and mm -hmm. you can identify the lanes to play around, then there are ways to, to like, there will always be like, I think a team with a, a better draft for early game okay. or for so pushing early game advantages. I, I made a, a statement um, a few weeks ago that got a lot of, uh, developed a lot of controversy, right? Where what if intentionally losing lane is actually a part of your team composition's strategy because then you I, defend I, I watched that video so yeah I know okay. you're talking okay so then what happens in that scenario where yeah you win lane but I mean I think I mean, like most, one most of... of the time you you accumulate small objectives and then you mm -hmm. you take camps so it's like your camps are yours mm -hmm. and then their camps are also yours um and then that results in a yeah and then there are some lanes that can't play from behind you know like if you mm -hmm. have like certain like silver lanes where you just in order to actually win the lane you have to push and, and leave then and then when you get forced into turret they can take pot shots at you and stuff like that so like you can counter counteract some you can actually take turrets you know through through the pressure okay. and intentionally losing okay. lane but then the idea is like you drafted a better mid game comp so or with more mid game tendencies i would say you know okay. i think so, so i think there are, i have three responses to that so first is if like it's part of your strategy to to lose an advantage in the early game, you still require mid lane mid early game training for that, right? Because you have to be able to necessarily minimize those losses or control when those losses occurring. Like like that's why I used the the Flash Wolves G two example with the LeBlanc and the Renekton because I felt like Flash Wolves were really really good at controlling like where they were going to yeah. get the deficit and where they knew that that was going to be. I still think that that requires early game training and that that's I, something yeah, that like, I agree. you can screw up on a lot. I agree with um, you. You can, you can know a lot about mid and late game, but if you fall too far behind, then it doesn't matter because you can't do those things that you know about 
So the deficit's uh, too big. Yes, and I also think that, um, I think in the example that you used, there was like, one of the analogies you used was like the Battle of Thermopylae. And yes. like the, the, of course, like the key point there is that they didn't actually win that, right? Even though they maximized like the defensiveness, they didn't, that they just kind of prolonged the inevitable. But it's like, it, it is kind of, so there is, there are a couple of different ways to, to look at that in the sense that like, okay, you can stall out the game really, really well, but you're still ultimately relying on the fact that like they will screw up and so your stalling will 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 benefit will have a benefit and you'll be able to capitalize and you'll be able to come back into it. So I still think that there's like still some flaws mm, I, in I actually, that kind of strategy. I think I I mean I do not believe in stalling. I think st stalling is like a yeah, I think that's fundamental passive playstyle is fundamentally bad. I think that I mean if you I, decide I to stalling, draft mid game I'm not necessarily even saying being playing passively. You mean I, playing patiently. I mean, until like, like, your composition yeah. comes online. Playing okay. patiently, yeah. I guess you could say. But I think, I think that you're you still can, looking you can... for you're still looking for okay. the enemy team to make. All right, play. let's let's transition into to Kelsey's closing statement, I guess. So my closing statement is that I think that you have to think about different phases of the game as how you're going to optimize training them and how you're going to to look at. <laughs> I guess, where you're going to find your competitive advantage and how you can do that. I think that actually, if you're good at training the early game and you have a good system for the early game, this can be, in a lot of instances, more punishing because like, if you are assuming like necessarily optimal play, it can be more punishing because if you are snowballing really hard and you have a lead, then for one thing, like you can make a lot more mistakes in the game. So... Uh, it's mid game can be less punishing, so maybe those decisions don't require as much training. Of course, I'm not advocating like that you shouldn't train mid game at all. <coughs> um, I also think that in the sense that like early game can be <coughs> early game compositions if they're drafted well, they can focus lane really really well. You can have different reactions that are trained by focusing early game as opposed to some team that might focus mid game baron calls or things like this that allow you to circumvent a lot of those situations. And then also I think that it's just like it really comes down to for me I can't discount early game because I'm not going to put the onus on my opponent to screw up if they're going to play too early game and I'm not. Okay. Uh, I, I do have to say I, I agree uh, with something in a in a specific sense where um, one of the one of the reasons I think Weldon is talking about like we we know that we can't be SKT uh, or the 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 best possible way to be SK Telecom or something is to hone the 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 mid and late game um, right Weldon that's what you said earlier yeah okay um. I think in, in that regard, yes, if you, if you have a, a strong mechanical foundation of the early game and it's always there uh, so that you can just jump from patch to patch to patch to patch to patch, yes, it lets, it lets you look at, at other uh, variables. Um, and in a, in a League of Legends setting uh, where the, the teams are practicing different parts, everyone's practicing different things, I feel like mid and late is actually the least focused on uh, amongst pro teams. Um, it, not necessarily that early game is like hyper focused, but I think that it's lesser focused on, and that ends up creating the discrepancy where if a team is inherently better across multiple lanes, we see this in NA and EU a lot, um, where if all the laners are significantly better, it can actually mask your mid and uh, late game weaknesses just because your early game is so strong. Right, we saw that with TSM in uh, last summer. Their early game was pulverizing everyone in the split, and then when it went internationally, uh, their mid and late game couldn't quite stack up. I mean, I think I, I would advocate too. early game too. Right, yeah. right, right. I mean, yeah, that's what I I think I'm advocating is that it's also a mistake to just think of like, and I didn't necessarily address this point as well as I thought I could have, but I think it's a mistake to think of early game as laning strictly 
Um, I think that there are a lot of macro concepts in the early game that are really important that might not be as generally emphasized by a team like... Uh, actually, I think Europe right now has this problem a lot where they have trouble transitioning one lane lead into a team. And there was even like the speech that I highlighted in the article where it seemed like there wasn't like a cl there was a clear delineation between what a team lead was and a lane lead was. When I think that there sh that should that distinction shouldn't necessarily be there because you should be able to transition that. And that's like an early game concept that I think a lot of teams are behind in um, in general. So. That's why I like I really, really kind of reacted the way I did and said that I don't advocate like abandoning early game training when I think there's a lot to be gained and there we're like drastically behind in it. And if we're already strong in certain aspects, then we should be able to touch that up better. Um, so that's part of the issue that I have. So my my final take on all of this is that it sounds like uh, both of you had a lot of misunderstandings in some areas with each other. Right, because uh, the article wasn't uh, able to be detailed enough, and Weldon's response maybe uh, wasn't able to talk to you directly, right, to hash out those differences. And I think that then what it comes down to is a, a philosophical uh, type of an approach, right, where we can use history and we can use statistics and stuff to back certain claims. Um, but then when it comes down to the what if everyone plays perfectly, then yes, every stage of the game is going to be equally as important. Um, my point of view is that, uh, from listening for the, the, the past two hours, though, is that some of the stuff does not necessarily argue directly against each other, and that's where the misunderstanding comes in. That's just my perspective, um, in the sense that there's some different topics that are actually being branched off into that don't even necessarily get addressed, if that makes sense. I lost You're, you on the last sentence. <laughs> the last sentence? What do you mean? I mean the, the branches where, where some things oh, oh, circle. Oh, oh, oh. Right. yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. In the in, in the debate, or do you mean in the misunderstandings, or do you mean just in the community in the where like everything's perfectly oh yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um and that's my final, I guess, take okay. on that. That's fun. Um I think though that I, I fully get what Kelsey's saying, and I agree with her in, in some regards uh, to the early game. Um, but in the sense of mid and late game, I don't think that the teams that are that good at mid and late game are giving up enough in early game to make it so that it's such a, a catastrophic deficit. Uh, going back to the very opening statement, Weldon referenced 0 to 3k gold, or even 0 to 5k gold. Um, I, I don't, don't think, think you can necessarily rely on getting that though if you don't train early game well. So. <laughs> okay. But there, there are there are teams that are significantly better at early game, and then there are teams that are significantly bad at early game. But good, like Samsung, their early mm -hmm. game was actually atrocious yes. by a lot of metrics. Um, even bottom LCK teams would have better uh, early games, but their, their mid and late game transition was superior to most of them. And I think, so they I, I, think I have a couple takeaways. I think one takeaway yeah. I have is that, like, although on my side, we had the strongest possible uh, early game that would have been humanly possible given the 12 weeks we had to train and and the training training, like, conditions that we had, like, uh, that doesn't mean that we should be off the hook for having been even better. So, like, one of the things that was really frustrating about, uh, you know, the, the TSM group stages was that we were the strongest that we could possibly be given the training time that we had. That was it. Like, we maximized it. I mean, we really pushed it to the limit. The extreme, I mean, I there was no can't. possible way. So, like, well, it's pot, but but like it was really nice to hear the basically like well that doesn't excuse you for not being good at it like it could still be better right so but that means it just takes more time right it just takes more training time uh, and and more um, more time before before the the early game could be oppressive enough to to fully clean the snowball off of I, and then I the other takeaway yeah. was. Um, before I forget it, let me just get it out there. Uh, oh, the other takeaway was that 
So my my opinion is that we don't want to waste team time on what can be a more individually controllable section. Like I feel like we can do just fine uh, asking the players to be good at the game and learn their matchups. And so much of the early game is tr- is so much of the mid game is absolutely impossible to train in solo queue. Whereas a good portion of the early game, if you count laning as part of the early game, is actually trainable in solo queue. You can actually train it. It's not perfect. It's not wonderful. It's not amazing. But in scrimmages and in solo queue, you can be on the hook for accomplishing that as an individual. And I think that, like, for me, the most optimal way of training is to really push that uh, to the extreme and then focus all the, the team training and on what I think is more important. My, my conclusion but that's, thing that's like is in a that vacuum. in a, in a perfect world... In an absolutely perfect world, I would agree with Kelsey. If pro teams had more time, right, they're, they're in the middle of splits. They, they don't have the luxury of being able to hone this early game to a point where it is such an edge that other teams just succumb to its pressure, even if they're a little bit weaker in mid and late game. Um, but I think that due to the time constraints and how the splits operate and a pro's lifespan and their their career, their career, et cetera, it's a lot better to actually play towards opponent or strengthen uh, what opponents are weak at. But I that, think that's, that's actually then what Kelsey's arguing, actually. Right. I, I think she's saying... It's but not I would say that teams are weaker at mid and late than they are at so, early game. Uh, um, oh, you uh, mean the opponent? Or you mean the, yeah, okay. Yes. Domestically, yeah. or are you arguing that's true for domestically, or... Even uh, even international, like if we just look at LCK, okay. right? You have you have KT and you have SKT. Um, I mean, and I look think at you can... look at SK, if you look at SK Telecom's games, they have a lot of games where by the first dragon, 10, 12, 13 minutes, they're even in gold. They're not falling too far behind. The opponent makes a mistake, boom, five k gold lead, ten k gold lead, yes. because their punish game is enormous. But even against the likes of Faker, you can have mid laners keep up with him. How much better can you really get at early game to topple? I mean, I think if all you're talking about is early game 1v... All you're talking about is 1v1 strategy or 1v1, like, trading in lane, then no. But I'm not arguing that. I think that there are a lot of openings that can be abused that LCK teams aren't necessarily. And I think we saw that with Tigers. Um, last year when Peanut was necessary, was actually able to just like kind of get away with like what people referred to as his living ward strategy because people weren't necessarily contesting his invades. And I think that like improving early game in that sense is is very possible. And we've seen like actually Western Taiwanese or even Chinese teams be better at like that punishing style of early game than even like the top Korean teams. So um, I think that that is where, if you agree with that statement, then you can find a competitive advantage there. So uh, it, <clears throat> I think that that's something that you can't dismiss. But is the advantage big enough to the point where your weakness compared to the other team in mid and late is not... Because, again, that's... Seen, I think theoretically, yes. And also we have seen examples where it is, though the the question then becomes are we able to get to a point where we can make that consistent i think that it's very possible and i think that we can um so that's why i have the stance i do okay all right i think that uh pretty much wraps it up unless well then you have something to conclude right off that ending just that your your twitch audience is the funniest audience i've ever seen (laughs) (laughs) it's just like (laughs) Why? Your Twitch chat is just, oh my god, it's amazing. It's incredible. <laughs> oh, wow. Why? Have you seen some of the polls they're putting up? No. <laughs> you I'm... have a choice between amazingly perfect LS, Coke Addict, or Bitch. Coke Addict more than Dream. Oh, I Coke just, yeah, yeah, I just bitch. clicked the straw poll. Yeah. <laughs> like, basically, they're concluding that you are the only gorgeous person here. Thank or you. and dateable person on both sides of the gender spectrum, uh, and then ninety nine percent of the comments are about how good you look. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Clear winner. All right. All right. <laughs> In the debate between two other people, LS wins. <laughs> okay. I love your audience. Sorry. So uh, I guess is that 
pretty much it. Are we are we all set? Yep. Okay. That's fine. All right. How do you feel, guys? I think the main takeaway I have is that um, it really looks like I'm on drugs most of the time when I'm streaming, which is kind of interesting because I think I'm just really, really high energy and super excited about life, and people take that as being drugged up. Okay. I'm living right. the dream, dude. All right. 30, 34 and working in eSport, that's like not uh, – usually it's a young man's game. So – Kelsey, anything? Yep. Is that it? Okay. Uh, I think so. All right. All right, guys. It was fun, and I hope that it was educational for everyone that watched. And I'm glad that it didn't get, like, out of hand or anything. Um, so in that regard, it's good. Thank okay. you for All right. educating. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for inviting me to do so. All right. I'll see you both later. Um, I muted.